All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is January 28th, 2024. And oh my goodness. <laughs> it's been a busy weekend of doing videos here at Ministry Revealed. Uh, on Friday, I was invited to to share with a group from a group that had broken away, you know, through what had happened with uh, with an old brother, Charles. And uh, I was invited there and I laid it all out for them. It was a lot of fun. It was like three hours and 45 minutes, about an hour, maybe covering questions. I mean, it was a big video. And man, you want to talk about from the harvest and what they revealed to the three feasts of the Lord and the timing of pre, mid and post and the gospels and the differences and the years and the jubilee. I mean, we went through a whole bunch and uh, it was so much fun. It was very exciting. Went from about 7.30 by the time I was done. Uh, and the questions and a little chat after was about 12.30 at night. So that was great. And yesterday, last night, which was Ministry Revealed video night, I did a three-hour video on today's video, which is all about the 144,000 so that people can understand it. They could see where they are. It's clear. They, they can, they'll be able to watch this. And whether they share it with people or or use it to better understand and clearly understand the 144, when they work, what happens to a portion of them, what their portion is, why, the whole nine yards. And you'll be able to now understand when somebody says, oh, I believe I'm one of the 144,000. Well, you'll have an idea that they probably aren't. Otherwise, they're going to be working all the way through seven years of SEALs and then be there in trumpets. And um, the reason people do it is because most people think that Revelation, for some reason, Revelation 7 is coming first, 144,000 sealed, then the great multitude rapture. We know that that's not true. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into that and make some points to very, very clearly prove it out and clearly prove out where the 144,000 are, when they work, and all of these portions to them. Well, that's what I did last night. I, you know, I hadn't slept very long the night before, so I'm like, man, last night I'm, I'm going to take a nap before I do this. So instead of starting my video last night at about 7.30, 8 o'clock, I started at 9. I finished by, uh, what was that? Oh, I guess what? 10, 11, almost midnight. So I was up late again, and I was, I was on fire because, I mean, you're going to be able to see in today's video the clear layout of the 144,000 and everything involved with them. And what happens? And so I was, you know, I always get energized after doing a teaching. And I was up till I was up at about 1.30. I saw after I had posted it, I started getting comments that there was no sound. And I thought, no, Lord, please. And so there was no sound. So I couldn't get to see. I was trying to see if I could figure out what had happened. And I don't know what it was. Uh, something with the Zoom. I'm not sure. So today I've switched to use my uh, screen pal um, to, to do today's video. I ran some tests first and there seems to be maybe a glitch on my laptop with, uh, with sounds in, in, on videos played in certain ways. And I don't know why, but when I tested it from screen pal today, after doing a little test and played it on screen pal, I could hear the voice. So lo and behold, I'm redoing last night's video after a three hour teaching. I'm redoing it here again today, trimmed up a little bit, and all of the, the good, juicy meat and potato parts uh, will be all in here. So with that, welcome back. Today, as you can see from the title, it's going to be all about the 144,000. And the reason for it is I had a brother that had asked, uh, that had asked me if um, there was a video specifically on the 144. And we know here in this ministry that there are three watches connected to pre, mid, and post. We know that just before the pre-trib group is taken, the pre-trib Gentile Bride of Christ, we know that a group is selected and chosen and told right beforehand because they're part of the pre-trib. They're watching, they're praying, they're diligent, they're seeking the Lord. And they're going to be told right before the pre-trib happens that they've been chosen to serve the Lord and remain. And at the end of the six years of seals, when the Lord comes on Mount Zion, he's going to select the 144,000 from among the group of people that are on the earth. And then they're going to help bring in the great multitude rapture. 
And then at the end of tribulation, when he returns on feet down on the Mount of Olives, he's going to choose a group from among them that remain throughout the tribes, and they're going to work during the millennial reign. So there's a group taken from the first group, there's a group taken from the second group, and there's a group taken from the third group. There are three watches within the three uh, of pre, mid, and post. And we generally, you know, I share a lot, especially on the first group. Because the first group is the one that everybody's most interested in. And I believe that a majority or a, a portion of us here in this ministry are a part of that group. And we've been getting prepared for the last six, almost and a half years through the revelations of the mysteries throughout Scripture. The mysteries in the prophetic revelations, these, these differences in the Gospels, the understanding the true timing of of the end of days revealed all throughout scripture which is a period of time of 14 years and a portion called above which is 50 days it's it's been an incredible journey and so generally i focus on the first portion but we include the 144 and then the group that works during the millennial reign well today i'm only going to touch to make a point on the the first group and the last group but the focus is going to be on the second group which are the 144,000, and you are going to clearly see for yourselves that it is them unequivocally during the time of trumpets. What happens to a portion of them, or at least one of them within it, and why it happened, and why it goes all the way back to when the law was given, and the events that come from it, including what Jesus has to say about it in himself that is connected to the end of tribulation through this group of the 144,000 in their typology in the is of what happened. So you'll often hear things like was, is, and is to come. So the was is from the beginning of creation to Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, and the is to come is from the moment of the pre-trib escape until the end of days. And when we show this, when I show this in in the um, seven churches, because you're going to see this connection in what we're talking about relating to the timing within the seven churches, and you're also going to see it in another form as I talk about what we call the chapters to years. These books that have opened to us where within their chapters gives us insight prophetically to the end of days. So we're going to cover all of these things and, and how they connect to it. And it's really, really, it, it's fascinating. So with that, I pray that the volume is all good. Everything records properly and perfectly. And for anybody that's new, you're probably already saying, what is he talking about? The differences of who the Gospels are speaking to. You know, 14 years in a portion called above. It's all true. If you're brand new, get ready to have your mind blown because all of scripture will start to open to you as it never has before and anybody that's new or newer and hasn't yet watched the intro series you can come to this playlist right here on youtube called the revealed end time study note series and begin with the first four videos all right you can also come to ministryrevealed.com here it is right here ministryrevealed.com it's loading because it's got a ton of videos on it and you're going to go to the intro page. So we have a book. No, I'm not promoting the book. We've got it available in five languages for free in PDF. And we've got the audio for free as well. But if somebody wants ebook or paperback, then you have to go to Amazon. But it's available in five languages for free in PDF. But what you want to do is you want to come to the intro page here. And when you, wanna, when you come to the intro, you have the same first four videos here in order. This first one is an intro to the next three. It'll, it'll touch on the next three videos that follow to, to begin to give you a little insight as to what you're going to understand. Then this one is the second video in the first and the threes, which is the intro to the Gospels and who they're speaking to. And what you're going to find out is in this 30-minute intro, you're going to see some incredible revelations which are the differences in the discord in in the gospels these differences in the gospels we've always been told that it was just perspective well it's not there are clearly differences within the same stories 
in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're clearly different, and there's no way around it, except when you understand that the differences within the Gospels are clearly revealing prophetic understanding. And this is what you're going to see. You're going to see things, which we're going to touch on tonight because it's connected. You're going to see, like in Luke's Gospel, when Jesus is going to the cross, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which is, means radiant, beautiful, white, gorgeous, kind of like a bride. In Mark, he's arrayed in purple, and in Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. Well, purple and scarlet are tribulation colors. You're going to notice that the pre-trib group is Luke. The mid-trib group for the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals is Mark's group. And the post-trib at the end of seven years in the seventh year of trumpets, which is the end of the 14th year, is the post-trib return of the Lord. The first group is going to the third heaven. The second group is going to paradise. And the third group, theirs is the city when the Lord returns. It is truly going to blow your mind if you've never seen it before. This is what follows. You're going to realize that these differences within the Synoptic Gospels, what was in the beginning, which is first, the first will be last, the last will be first. You'll realize that Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end is Luke, Mark, Matthew. And you'll see that when it comes to it, these differences that will lead you into the discourses and their differences in the discourses are revealing a portion called above, which is Luke's portion above before the 14 year start, that 40, 50 day period. And then Mark's discourse is seven years of seals and Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. And that gets revealed to you. You begin to understand it once you realize these differences within the Gospels. Now, how was this all missed? Well, this is video number four. This is a big one. This one's about two hours and 45 minutes. And this one, it's not because the churches were hiding it and so forth. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that it was the timing of the Lord of when it was to be revealed, which was in this final generation. And we've been blessed to receive it. You're going to see that we haven't understood these things because it's all because of Matthew. We've all been taught for hundreds of years from the gospel of Matthew and even though we know it's written to the to the to the house of Judah, the Jews, nobody ever really fully understood who Mark and who Luke were written to. They've kind of understood a little bit about Mark, but not fully. And even in realizing there was this conversation in Mark, they never knew what it meant. And then with Luke, even less. So everybody's foundational teaching for hundreds of years has been from the gospel of Matthew. And when you realize that that's what caused everybody to believe seven years and then argue and debate over pre, mid, or post, and bounce, and jump back and forth, you realize it was all because we've been taught from a foundation of Matthew. But once you realize who all three groups are speaking to and in their portion of time, it's going to absolutely, I mean, it's going to blow your mind. It's so exciting once you understand it, the scriptures completely open up to you as they never have before. Then if you want, you can go in deeper. And this one is like a three-hour Bible study of the differences in the Gospels. Here's like I was telling you, the differences in the discourses as well within the Gospels are revealed. Luke first, then Mark, then Matthew. You will understand prophecy as you've never seen and understood it before. And then you can keep going through, understand pre, mid, is po and post are all true. Pre happens at the beginning, right before the 50 days start. The mid happens in the midst of the seventh year of seals. And the post happens at the seventh year of trumpets, which is the start of the 14th year of tribulation. It's awesome. All right. So that's a little glimpse of of what you'll you'll come to understand and to learn here at the ministry. And you will really, truly understand the Gospels, as I've said, as you never have before. And prophecy will reveal itself incredibly. So in today's video. Some of you guys might remember this. I shared this uh, a couple of few videos back. And I thought it was really interesting because I hadn't realized, I hadn't gone in to dig into it. You see, it's we talk about these three remnant worker groups from each of the groups. But, you know, and, and we also know that they're from the priestly line. We know that they are priests. And we've clearly understood this, you know, from the first group that comes from the pre-trib that will be with the Son of Man for 40 days and then remain to work during seals. We know this very well 
because we know that they represent the workers from Smyrna. And Smyrna that works during seals, that group is the one that gets resurrected to rule and reign with Christ in the millennial reign. And when they reign with them, they're called, they'll rule with them as priests, right? Priests and kings. And so we know that they are a priestly line. And we know that there are three groups of them. But what was fascinating is even though I understood this, I hadn't actually delved into the Levitical line realizing there were three priestly portions before. And we spoke about it in a recent video when I saw this that was shared with me. I believe this brother's a Canadian as well. And I thought it was fascinating that there were three portions from the Levites that are the priestly lines. And check it out. As I was preparing for yesterday's video, which is today's video, that's exactly what happens. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, there are three lines from the Levitical line, which is precisely what he's showing here. And what I had shown in this part here when I shared on this before. So we got three different worker groups, one from here that works here, one from here that works here, and then one from here that works the millennial reign. So we've got three watches, three priestly portions of their lines, one that works seals, one that works trumpets, and one that works the millennial reign. So this is something we've really, we've understood it, but yet I hadn't yet realized that within the Levitical line, there were three priestly lines. So that was an incredibly awesome confirmation. And what we're going to focus on today is the second one. So if you guys will all remember this, we clearly know that there are three watch groups during the end of days. Now, I did a video not too, too long ago about the four watches, right? Uh, no, that's the coming four messiahs. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There we go. So about two, three months ago, called the four watches revealed. But in it, I explain they're not really four watches. The, the, the number two, three, and four are the official three watches. But the first one that I was including as a watch has to do with the apostles. But the apostles, they stand on their own. There will be a new 12 apostles anointed for the beginning of the end of days that will work at least during the time of seals as well. But they're not this portion of the three watches. They're, they're chosen and anointed with the Holy Ghost on day one of the 50 days after the pre-trib happens. But they're not one of these three watches. Okay? These three specific watches are these three portions of the Levitical line. Okay? They're the three portions of the priestly lines. So, who are they? Well, we've covered this guy, these guys before, right? Let's go to Luke chapter 12. And remember, the focus is going to be, though, on the second group, okay? So we know this one very well. The very first group is the group that right before the pre-trib happens, the Lord is going to make known to a group that's been chosen to be his servants. They're going to be made known right before the pre-trib happens. Why? Because they, could you imagine being watching, praying, diligently seeking the Lord, loving and repentant? And the pre-trib happens and you knew it was coming and you were left behind. You'd be, you'd be panicking. You'd be freaking out. Okay? So we can see, and this is why it's such a blessing, that we know here from Luke 12, he's telling this first group ahead of time, who are a group from the pre-trib bride that are selected to remain, it called the first watch. It says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh he may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom when the Lord cometh he shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make him to sit down to eat and he will come forth and serve them. This group right here never has anything negatively spoken against them. Okay? And when you come, as we've shared many times, in Luke chapter 24... It's directly related to the two on the road to Emmaus. We see that when the Lord comes, he has a meal with them as he sat to eat with them and took bread, blessed it, and gave it to them. So they're sitting down to eat together, and the Lord is serving them. We know that this group 
is the only one of all of the these resurrection stories in the discourses and in the gospels and their differences in them this is the only one that he sits and eats with directly connected in the prophetic typology of an end of days group <coughs> that he's going to do this with when he returns from the wedding we know that he's going to open their understanding they're going to have the understanding of the law the prophets the psalms and it's going to be the understanding which is prophetically related to the end of days and what does he tell them he says in verse 47 of luke 24 and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at jerusalem this is also the only gospel that says beginning at jerusalem why because when the lord returns from the wedding and they're waiting for him to return and he knocks and they open they're going to be i believe translated to a place where the lord is going to have a meal with them and then they're going to follow him for 40 days as the son of man as he said he would do as jonah did then he leaves at the end of 40 days there's three days later and that is then the anointing of what we call acts 2.0 they're going to receive the promise of the father in this acts 2.0 and then on the day and hour no one knows which is the feast of trumpets i believe it will happen in 2024 they will begin from jerusalem with that holy ghost anointing and they will go out from jerusalem and bang we know jerusalem is attacked and destroyed by syria who had compassed them about at that time so we see this conversation going on this is the first watch group and they're with them from that meal to start the 40 days to the end of 40 days they wait then in jerusalem and they receive the anointing of acts 2.0 and now they continue going off to work during at least the time of seals well the second group in luke chapter 12 we see that there's a second watch and there was a third watch you see and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and 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 find them so blessed are those servants so what what has to be said about the second watch or third watch well the first one had nothing negative against them and who is the second watch well the second watch just as you go to the end of the gospel of luke you see this first watch when you go to the end of the gospel of mark you find the second watch and what does he say in this second watch well they were already eating so it's clearly not the same as the one in luke where he sat with them and served them and ate with them because they weren't they were the first watch this is the second watch and this is a prophetic picture of the end of the first six years of seals when the lord is coming on heavenly mount zion and what do we see when this group the lord has come on heavenly mount zion what do we know who's the lord going to appear to first check it out he's going to appear it says in mark 16 12 after that he appeared in another form unto two of them well who are the two of them they were those workers that remained alive still by the end of six years of seals they were the workers of seals from luke and they remained alive and they were coming to tell the residue they're coming to tell those that remain to the end of seals those that survived and it's a specific group of these people and he's coming to tell them look the lord's coming be ready be ready why well this group understood they know it's connected to the day and hour no one knows this group isn't in the dark on these things and then what happens then the lord shows up the lord is now going to show up to this prophetic typology here of the hundred and forty four thousand which is revelation chapter 7 right at the beginning in verse 1. but what does he do he unbraids on them you see he rails on them so right off the bat we're seeing something being spoken negatively or happening negatively against them right because of their unbelief and their hardness of heart almost like oh, okay yeah sure he's coming sure he's coming you see but this first group of workers of seals knew it they were prepared this group connected to the 144 in the typology they're the ones that have something negatively spoken against them and after he says that listen to what the lord says their commission is going to be and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature why do we know it's to every every creature well i'm going to show you because the 144,000 are responsible 
for helping very at first their first job is going to be to help whoops is going to be to help the workers of seals bring in the great multitude rapture because there's not enough workers and it says and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned and these signs shall follow them that believe listen to this in my name shall they cast out devils okay they're going to be able to cast out devils they shall speak in new tongues they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them and then what do we read about verse 19 uh, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God we know when the Lord is going to sit in the prophetic end of days when he is going to sit on the right hand of God we know this from Psalms 110 and when is it it's when he is high priest and king after the order of Melchizedek and after the order of Melchizedek he's going to be ruling in the midst of his enemies because even during the time of trumpets once it starts he's even though and he's made a peace agreement he's the one that made a covenant not a peace agreement but a covenant it's still going to be in the midst while the world is going through the first four trumpets right the first four trumpet judgments <laughs> so he's still ruling in the midst of his enemies not everybody's been put under his feet yet and so we know this happens when he comes as the messiah ben joseph the the son of Eve, ephraim right the high priest and king the joshua type the the melchizedek type and as the high priest what is he he is high priest and he's got the priestly group under him right he's got the priestly sons under him like aaron and his sons and what does it say in verse 20 and they went forth and preached everywhere the lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following when we go into our chapters to years as i was showing in the beginning the lord is coming at the end of the sixth year of seals or the start of the seventh year on the day and hour no one knows when he does we know that there's going to be this connection to the two the ones that were working during seals the remnant workers that are connected to them he's going to meet with them briefly as we saw he appeared unto them in another form and then right at the beginning of the seventh year of seals we go to revelation 7 and it's the 144,000. and when he comes as that he's coming as what he's coming as melchizedek high priest and king well if you go to hebrews chapter 7 which even in our chapters to years chart there's hebrews chapter 7 equivalent to the seventh year of seals and look at what we read it's all about melchizedek for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning, listen to this, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings. What slaughter of kings do you think this is? It's the slaughter that happened in the Ezekiel 39 war at the end of seals. So he's returning from the slaughter of kings. And there he is. It happened at the end of, Se at the, end of the sixth year of seals, and Melchizedek is there. Who is now showing up and it says what to whom abraham gave a tenth part of all wasn't that fascinating gave a tenth part of all and we know that what the hundred and forty four thousand are the first fruits of the grapes they're now the first fruits of the grapes that are being sealed and he's given a ten percent of all to melchizedek if you go to Genesis chapter 14, again, lines up in the same time frame of chapters to years, the very first uh, um, time Melchizedek shows up in Scripture, and it's Abraham there from coming back from that battle, is chapter 14 of Genesis. When you go to John, which we're going to go into, John is fascinating in the chapters to years, especially from chapter 15 forward in the portion of trumpets, but also in chapter 14 why is chapter 14 so powerful as well in john we'll get to the rest of john later but in john chapter 14 jesus says i go to prepare a place okay in verse 2 john 14 2 in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go to prepare a place for you 
I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What do we know that is? That's because at the end of the sixth year of seals, this is the Lord returning on heavenly Mount Zion in the clouds, like Mark's discourse says. He's coming in the clouds on the day and hour no one knows. And when he's coming on the day and hour no one knows, what do we know from Revelation chapter 6? In Revelation chapter 6, we see that the whole world, that everybody is in a panic. All the kings of the earth, great men, everybody, hiding in the mountains, in the dens, in the, uh, uh, you know, in the rocks of the mountains, saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. They're clearly seeing something. Guys, I don't think we really comprehend what it is that's going to be seen. It's going to be the mountain of the Lord. He's, he's, he's coming with paradise. He's coming to receive that group in the seventh year of seals. This is the end of the sixth year of seals when they see him coming. And in the seventh year is when he's going to receive them to paradise, which is the mid-trib great multitude rapture group. You see, this is what we get from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in the above portion, which is before, right at the 50 days when it's about to start, the first group is going to the third heaven. The second group is the was caught up that goes to paradise. Then you have the prophetic picture with John. Then he says, now I'm coming the third time. Why? Because it was a taking to the third heaven, a taking to paradise, and then a return feet down, which is for the city. So we can see this playing out we can see where this all of this is taking place and the timing here connected with the second watch so the people are in a panic they're freaking out they see what's coming now if we go to luke chapter 12 again we'll come back to these guys but i wanted to make a point also now with the third watch the third watch we see right there was a, a third watch as well and who's the third watch if you go to the third watch, you go to Matthew chapter 8 at the end of his gospel, and the conversation is completely different. They're not even being sat down to eat or anything. They're going into the mountain where Jesus had, had appointed them. Um, we see in verse 18, halfway through, it says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, this is exactly what we read about at the seventh trumpet. At the seventh trumpet, it's the Lord returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives, all power in heaven on earth, and has been now given to him. The mystery is over at the beginning of the sound of the seventh trumpet, which is the start of the 14th year of tribulation. It's Zechariah chapter 14 at the beginning of it when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And so look at what he tells this third group, this third watch. He tells them, go ye therefore, teach all nations. So there's no longer preaching like the Luke group had or the Mark group had. Because why? Because now the Lord is here. The whole world will have seen him. So you don't need to preach Christ anymore. They're going to go teach his ways. And when you get to verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Why? Because at the 14th year of tribulation, he is now here till the end of the millennial reign. He is literally here till the end of the world with them. And do you know what's being said about this group? Nothing negative. The Luke group had nothing negative. The Matthew group had nothing negative. But the Mark group had their first negative encounter when Christ came to speak to them when he unbraided on them for their hardness of heart. Well, what you come to find out is when you go to the discourses, we see that in Luke's discourse, remember the, the, the first worker group, the first group when he returns from the wedding is this right here. The 40 days are now beginning. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you, persecute, delivering up into synagogues, into prisons. You go down to verse 16, and you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends, and some of you they shall cause to be put to death. But you have no negative report. You know, not a hair on your head will perish. This is the patience, uh, possess you your souls. There's nothing negative spoken against this group. And we know they don't only work the 40 days, but they will also work during seals. So here we see some of you 
will they cause to be put to death? If we go to Revelation chapter 2, which is for the seven churches, what most people haven't realized in the end of days is that when the pre-trib happens, the moment of the pre-trib happens, the seven churches will begin again with Ephesus at the start of the 50 days once the pre-trib has happened. And they will play out. What played out in the Old Testament over 2,500 years in a prophetic typology in the picture of the seven churches, what played out over about 2,000 years in the is of the seven churches, in the end of days will play out over 50 days and 14 years. This is why Mark's discourse says it will be at a it'll be a time as it never was in all of history up to that point. And then you go to Matthew's discourse and it says it'll be even worse and it'll be a time as it never has been up to that point nor nor either ever shall be again. You see because Matthew's is the trumpet's time. That's when the pit is open and it's way worse than the antichrist and false prophet. It'll be the antichrist, false prophet, beast and the pit open. Okay? That's why it says that. Because what played out over 2,500, 2,000 years will play out over 50 days and 14 years. That's how intense the end of days are going to be. But it's going to restart the seven churches. And what do we know about the groups of the seven churches? We know Smyrna doesn't have a negative report, right? Right? They, they don't have the, uh, let's go see it. They don't have the report, right? Watch this. Uh, um... Where's the the portion? Da, 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 da. He that overcometh to eat. Him that hath an ear, say unto the church, him that overcometh. They don't have that same negative report, right? So there were only two, which was uh, uh, Smyrna and Laodicea. Uh, uh, sorry, Smyrna and Philadelphia. But now watch what happens. This is that first Luke group. Again, I said we're not going to spend much time in it, but listen to what it says in verse 10. Fear none of those things. Well, first of all, if you come to verse 9, you know, I know they poverty. Uh, da, 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 ten, da, 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 da. Where did I want to go? Okay, yeah, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you, remember that? Some of you into prison that you may be tried and shall have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. It says, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay, this is what I was saying in the beginning. We know that this first group is the portion that gets to resurrect as priests reigning with Christ for the millennial reign. They're the ones that are part of the first resurrection. Only them and the rest of the dead, not until the thousand years were over. Because this is the group, the priestly group, the first of the three watches of the priestly group that are going to be reigning with the Lord. And what did it say? Some of you shall they cause to be put to death and cast into prison. It's the same thing that we're reading in the portion talking to us about the 40 days in Luke's portion, right? Uh, lay their hands on you, persecute some of you that shall cause to be put to death. Well, we know that this first watch group is also going to be working during seals, which is Mark's discourse. And at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals, we see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Okay, this is this him coming in the clouds in Mark's discourse is the end of the sixth seal when the whole world is seeing that. What do you think the whole world is seeing, guys? They're seeing Daniel chapter 2. When the stone that was carved without hand smashes the, the feet of the image, which is the, the, the war of Ezekiel 39, the end of the sixth year, which is the um, Revelation chapter 17, uh, when it's the beast and the 10 kings. That's this same battle that's taking place. And what is it? It says a stone comes, smashes it, destroys the image, and the stone becomes a great mountain covering the earth. That's what they're seeing coming. People are going to be in a panic seeing this. What is this going to look like in our physical? I have no idea. Some sort of massive mountain coming? Cover all of Jerusalem and Israel or parts of the earth? I, I don't know. But it's enough that in Revelation chapter 6, at the end of six years of seals, these guys are in an absolute panic. 
But the world is in a panic. But listen to what it says. We know that the six years will begin, uh, the 14 years will begin at the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets. We've understood that. We've been revealing that here in the prophetic revelation of the start of the end of days with the 50 days that comes first. And here we are, a group of people realizing that the end of six years, it will be at the day and hour no one knows. Now listen to what it says. Remember, and who is he talking to here? He's talking to the same two on the road to Emmaus that were with them during 40 days. They remained during seals. And they're the two, right? Some of them were killed, but some of them remain still. They're the ones from the end of Mark chapter 16, the two that came to tell the 144 next what was about to happen. This is a picture of the Lord now coming to them before he goes to the 144. Because listen to the words that he says. Take heed, watch, and pray. It's, it's like that same group from Luke, right? For you know not when the time is. It didn't say the day and hour here. It just says, now that he's talking to this group, he says, for you know not when the time is. The I would say the 144,000 are probably of this group saying, oh, but nobody knows that day and hour. And so, you know, they're stiff-necked and everything else and they're not willing to believe the two from the road to Emmaus, the two that represent the workers during seals who have, under, who have already understood these things because we saw in Luke 24, he opens their understanding about these things of the end of days and the prophetic. And so when it comes to this group, he's now saying, okay, so remember, take heed, watch and pray for you know not when the time is. He's not talking specifically to this group as, you know, you wouldn't know the day and hour. We know as this remnant group working during seals that it is going to be the Feast of Trumpets six years later. But the Feast of Trumpets is a two-day event on a day and hour no one knows. But not everybody knows that. But this group does. Because then he goes on to say in verse 34, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house will come. Listen to this. At even or midnight or at the crowing or in the morning. See what he's saying? You guys are aware of this period of time, but you don't know the exact time of day when it's going to happen. So be ready, be watching, be praying. And who is he talking to? The authority he gave his servants when he was with them for 40 days. That's who he's talking to. See, lest coming suddenly I find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. No condemnation to this group. But what do we know now happens? Well, if we go to Revelation, we now know the end of the six year of seals is this time of Mark 13's discourse coming to the end. It's at this point right here. They see heavenly Mount Zion coming. They, the, the one, the, the workers from seals, those servants we now see are there. They're to be paying attention. They may not know the, they, they might know the day and hour, meaning feast of trumpets, which is over a two day period, but they won't know what time of day it's coming. And this is when he's coming. So we know that he meets with them briefly, right? He's they're, they, they're aware of it. They acknowledge it. And then what happens? Well, if this is the end of the sixth year of seals, and then you go to chapter 7, which is the beginning of the seventh year, now you have the 144,000 sealed. If you go to chapter 8, what is chapter 8? Then he opened the seventh seal. And there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. This seventh seal is the time when the Lord makes the covenant with all nations. It's in the, the second portion, the second half approximately, uh, second half of the seventh year of seals, and it's the Lord who makes the covenant with all nations. So if it's the end of the sixth seal at the end of chapter six, and at the beginning of chapter eight is the start of the seventh seal, why on earth do people believe the 144,000 are going to be sealed first and then the great multitude rapture happen. It doesn't make any sense. Right? I mean, unless somebody believes that seals have already played out over decades and over the last few hundred years, 
then they'll say, oh, see, seals have already played out. All we're waiting for, and I have heard this before, people say we're only waiting for the sixth seal to happen. So if you believe that we're only waiting for the sixth seal to happen, and then the 144,000 and then the great multitude rapture, Okay, you would have someone, I could see why you would say that. <laughs> Except for the fact that that means you believe that the four horsemen of the apocalypse have nothing to do with the apocalypse. You would have to believe that, that seals has already happened and that it has nothing to do with the end of days, even though it clearly talks about the end of days and that it would be upon the whole earth. You see, a lot of people don't realize who believe that what Luke 21 told us in his discourse. Luke 21, 34 told us that watch ye therefore, da, 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 let's go verse 35. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. It's coming to the whole earth. And a lot of people fail to recognize that events happening here in one part of the world or here in a couple parts of the world Oh, see, it's it's part of the end of days. So that's why I believe we're only looking for the sixth seal to start. No, it's absolutely not true. It's going to be upon the whole earth once it begins. The whole earth. You see, that is why there's a pre-trib. Because that group is not accounted their portion with seals. They Luke's group, you don't find the word tribulation in anything of the pre-trib group connected to Luke. You only find the word tribulation and the words from tribulation in Matthew and Mark. So it's clear, <clears throat> excuse me, that the 144,000 are sealed in the seventh year at the beginning of the seventh year of seals. And so that's what we were seeing when we went to the end of Mark's dis of gospel. We saw the two that represented those that worked during seals that knew the time was at hand of the day and hour. But the 144 with their with their thickness didn't believe it and didn't want to acknowledge it. And so now then the Lord is here and we know he's about they're about to be anointed or, 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 or sealed. Why are they being sealed? Why did the 144,000 get sealed? <clears throat> excuse me, before the great multitude rapture, which is the mid trib group going to paradise because the Lord has come with. Heavenly Mount Zion with paradise to receive those people that he said he would bring, just like the chapters to years, Matt, uh, uh, John 14. Why is it happening that the 144,000 are sealed first? This answer comes to us from Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, we see um, uh, another 70 are anointed, uh, appointed. Uh, verse 2, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. You have to remember the great multitude rapture is going to be, I believe, a little over a 1.2 billion people, which I believe the majority, maybe a few hundred million were, died, were killed, but the majority of that, in a guesstimated number, maybe seven, 800 million are still alive. The ones who were bringing these people in was one with the help of the apostles, but mainly, it was those two represented on the road to Emmaus, which are, I believe, two sets of 12, which are 24,000 people. So the laborers are few, and some of them have died. Right? Of course, they had other people that worked with them, that came to Christ, and, you know, they're all helping each other out. But it's those 24 were, that were the main ones that the Lord had the meal with and appointed. And now the laborers are few. So they need to pray, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers forth into the harvest. Hello. That's the 144,000. It's the 144,000 being sealed first, and their first job will be to come and help bring in the great multitude rapture, which doesn't happen at the beginning of the seventh year of seals, but happens about four, five, six, seven months into the seventh year of seals. This is why in Mark's gospel, when you see the differences in the transfiguration story, in Mark 9, 1, it's the only one that said is, says it like this in a past tense. Verily I say unto you, 
that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen past tense the kingdom of god come with power when are they going to see it after six days which is a prophetic picture of after the six years of seals they shall they will have seen it come you see they will have seen it come but they don't know when they're going yet that's the difference that's because the great multitude rapture doesn't happen till about midway through the seventh year of seals and so when we go back into luke chapter 10 we now see again we see that the 144,000 are the laborers coming in to bring in the harvest of the great multitude rapture and after they do all this and they've done these things what do they do well then trumpets begins right then you have trumpets time beginning so when the seven years of seals come to an end the great multitude rapture has come in in the midst of the seventh year in the second half in the latter portion of the seventh year of seals the lord makes a covenant with all nations and now you have like revelation chapter 14 you now have the hundred and forty four thousand with the lamb that's standing on mount zion you have to ask yourself what is the lord doing standing on mount zion with the hundred and forty four thousand having their father's name written in their foreheads hello you see why, why, why are they on mount zion you see because they were here on the earth they were chosen from among men on the earth and we see this even in Revelation chapter 7, where we see, uh, it says, uh, come and descending, four angels. See, uh, halfway through verse 2 of Revelation 7, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, right? Say, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Same word, 1909. So we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Well, what are these four angels holding back the four winds? It's the first four trumpets that are next coming. So they're holding back the next four trumpets that are going to start when the seven years of trumpets begin, and they're to hold it back till this portion has been taken care of. And what's happened? They're the servants of God the Father, and they have the seal in their foreheads. Now we go back to Revelation 14, and in Revelation 14, it says, And I, a, a, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000, having the Father's name, not the Son's name, having the Father's name written in their foreheads. Why? Because these are the fathers. These are the fathers, and he gave them to the Son. It's all connected. It's the 144,000 that the Father gave the Son. And they're what? Well, at this point, the Lord is on Mount Zion. He is Melchizedek, the high priest. He is the high priest and king. Remember, he's ruling, and Zerubbabel from Zechariah, Zerubbabel in the prophetic Zechariah in the is to come, he is the one who is, remember, the, the rule is between them both. And Zerubbabel is going to be responsible now for rebuilding the temple, the city, the street, the wall is going to start to get rebuilt. And so look at what we read about where these guys come from. Uh, verse 3, Revelation 14, verse 3. And they sang a new song as it were before the throne, before the four beasts, before the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So they were redeemed from the earth. But where are they? Where are they standing here? Well, we know that they're standing on heavenly Mount Zion because they're there with the Lamb. Heavenly Mount Zion is part of the kingdom of God that came down where the great multitude rapture went. And these guys were chosen from among the men first. Listen to what it says next. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they, listen to this, which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. These are they which re were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God 
and to the lamb. Okay, so what was it? They were redeemed from the earth. Uh, they were virgins. They follow the lamb wheresoever he goeth. Remember Mark 16? That prophetic picture, that typology of them here. And it said on the right hand, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. So everywhere they go, and the Lord is working with them. It's the same context of conversation connected to the 144,000 when they're being sealed. But we saw also that there was, in the beginning, there's this little bit of, you know, warning to them like, hey, 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 be ready, smarten up, right? You guys had a hard heart there at first. And then it says what? That they were virgins. So who do we know this is? We know now that this began the 50, this began the 40. They worked during seals. That The church of Sardis is the seventh year, right? It's the end of seals. It's when the Lord has come, say, at the end of the sixth year to the start of the seventh year of seals. It's their church reformation time, which is directly related to Israel's kings, right? The house of Israel and their kings because the Lord has returned. He's come on heavenly Mount Zion. He's restored. He's reformed the church. The great multitude has come in. And now who's going to start to work trumpets? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, they're the missionary movement. They're, they're the, um, they're the uh, evangelists. Right? So if they're the evangelists, and we know it's Philadelphia, they're the second watch group. Uh, and yeah, they're the second watch group that are now going to be going out during trumpets. They're called virgins. They're one of the seven churches. They're virgins, and they're the church of Philadelphia. You see, what most people, again, because they don't understand that the seven churches are going to replay again in the end of days, they think we're just going to be in, most people believe or think that we're going to be in Laodicea till the very end of days. Yet they believe a great revival is coming, which is impossible in the Laodicean age. It's got to happen in the apostolic age. So because they don't realize that the seven churches will replay during the 50 and 14 years of tribulation, they think we're always in the Laodicean age. And when you think we're in the Laodicean age, you could see why they would think, oh, maybe Philadelphia and this time. They don't understand the order of things for the end of days and what's going to happen. So they look at it as, oh, Philadelphia. Well, it could be Philadelphia. It could be this. It could be that. And so they believe, see, Philadelphia, oh, that's the one. They have no negative things spoken about them. Those are the 144,000. And the people that think that are correct that they're the 144,000, but they just don't understand how and where it applies in the timing. It's impossible without the differences in the Gospels and especially the timeline of the true timeline of above 50 days and 14 years. So if they're Philadelphia, they're virgins, which is one of the seven churches. Let's go see. Check this out. In our chapters to years again, okay? Here's our chapters to years when the Lord has come, seals them, and has that group. We showed how John is when he would receive them. We see when he comes as Melchizedek, high priest and king. We saw that it was after the battle. And now what happens? If we go to Acts chapter 21, also equivalent to the seventh year of seals, look what happens. Let's go to Acts chapter 21 and see what it has to say. In verse 8 and 9. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, right? Like an abbreviation of Philadelphia, right? And then it says, what is he? The evangelist, right? The the church of Philadelphia are the evangelists. And it says, which was one of the seven. Hello. Philadelphia evangelists, one of the seven, which means one of the seven churches. And listen to what it says about his daughters. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. <laughs> it gets pretty clear, doesn't it? It gets very, very clear when we look at the description for the 144,000 and connected to Philadelphia. Now, we saw that his daughters, his four daughters were virgins. So if he represents Philadelphia and his daughters were the ones represented as virgins, is it possible, as I sip my coffee, is it possible 
that the 144,000 are women. It's possible, but I don't believe so. But based on what we saw about Philip, about Philip there, I'm not going to say it's not possible. But when you read the wording of Revelation 4.4, it says, we're not defiled with women. It would be odd to say we're not defiled with women because they were women, right? It's kind of strange. You know, and it's like others that say, that say, um, uh, uh, oh, they're the, they were the little kids from 2,000 years ago that were killed at the time of Christ. Why would you describe two-year-olds or one to two-year-olds as virgins? That's ludicrous, right? It doesn't make any sense. And they're not going to come back as little two-year-olds to come and save everybody during tribulation. So even if it was a, a whole group of them coming back as now adults, you would have no idea that they were the children before anyways. But you see, when, when, when prophecy is all jumbled up, all sorts of wild ideas come from it, right? But you're not going to call two-year-olds virgins. And I don't think you would call because they were not defiled with women. I mean, it doesn't make sense that you would say that for them being women not having been defiled with women but i'm not gonna say no it's not possible that there are some that are women or that they may all be women because of what philip tells us about them as well so we get quite a bit of description here about them and you got to remember they're they're sealed they have the father's name written in their foreheads being sealed they're before the lamb and before the lord having been redeemed from among men on the earth, and they're the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. You see, they're the first fruits, but they're not the only first fruits. They're the first fruits of the grapes. They're the first fruits of the grapes. You see, I did a, a teaching a long time ago, and it was so, all of this is absolutely 100% Holy Spirit led without any doubt i fully understand it but there are moments when certain things happen that really blow my mind and one of them was for some reason i don't even know it was just spirit led i went to the last chapter of romans the last chapter of first corinthians and the last chapter of second corinthians and i saw the same thing play out as the end of luke the end of mark and the end of matthew a group was taken and a group was chosen to remain a group was taken and was now gone, and another group is ready to remain and work. And then the same with the third one. It was fascinating. Now let me show you this example. In Romans chapter 16, we get the prophetic picture of this right here. This is the prophetic picture of the pre-trib escape. Starting in verse 25, midway through, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures... Of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of the faith who are those in the obedience of faith made known in this mystery that had been kept secret since the beginning is now made known to all nations it's the pre-trip it's the prophetic yes it was Christ back then but it is the prophetic pre-trib taking place at the very beginning because it's being made to all nations, made known to all nations, where as Luke 21, 30, 35 said, it would come up as a snare upon the whole world, which is all nations. For them, disobedience, for the obedience in faith, they're the ones that are gone. So at the end of it, you get this, this greeting or this doxology about saying, this is what happens first, that group is gone. And from them, what do we have? A group of workers that have been remained chosen to remain so you have this priscilla and aquila which are a prophetic picture of the group of smyrna and how do we know that they're the ones that will work seals well the the picture we have is right here for uh who have for many laid uh, sorry who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only i give thanks but also all the churches of the gentiles why all the churches of the gentiles they're putting their necks on the line because those are the ones that are going out during seals, putting their necks on the line, be being beheaded, not taking the mark and everything else. And theirs is going to be the reward of the millennial reign with the Lord. And who are they doing it for? All the churches of the Gentiles. 
because the Gentile age will end at the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. And that's, that's what this is a picture of. And what are they called? Listen to what it says in verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved uh, Empedus, who is the first fruits of Achia unto Christ. Now, you would think, well, wait a second. Are you saying that this is the 144,000? No. I'm telling you that there are two first fruits. You see, Christ was the first fruits of the feast of first fruits, which was barley. The remnant group which is with the Lord who will have the meal in the first watch is represented by this group who will put their necks on the line during the time of seals. They are the first fruits of the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Hello. They're the first fruits of the wheat. You see, the pre-trib is gone. They're the first fruits of the wheat. And this is a portion of them that remain to work. It's the Luke remnant ones that remain to work during the 40 days and during the time of seals, and they had nothing negative spoken against them. We come to 1 Corinthians 16, and in 1 Corinthians 16, we go to the end of it first to see who's gone, and listen to what it says. 16, 19, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 19, the church of Asia, so the churches of Asia salute you. Priscilla and Aquila salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So they just finished their Romans portion, the end of Romans. They just finished working seals. And now them and those who are in their house, that remnant worker and those who are with them that they worked with along the way, now they're gone. And so we go to see who's ready to work next. And what does it say? Now concerning the collection of the saints. Now in the is of what happened, this was about the collection of money for the saints and so forth, right? But in the prophetic with your end time eyes, it's now concerning the collecting of the saints. He's coming to get the great multitude rapture. And before he does, before this takes place, when he, when he gets the, the saints, we see in verse 3, And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberty unto Jerusalem. Who is this? He's talking about the 144,000 who have been approved, who are going to help bring in the great multitude rapture with the Priscilla and Aquila in the prophetic picture of those two on the road to Emmaus at the end of Mark's gospel. That's exactly what you're seeing. And look at what these guys are called. In verse 15, it says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achia, and that they had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Remember, the 144,000 are going to be the first fruits of the next group, which is grapes, but they're going to first help bring in the great multitude of the saints. This is what we're seeing. All of these prophetic end time pictures within all of these things. There was much more prophecy in scripture than what people say a third of the Bible. It's practically the whole thing. In 2 Corinthians, what would 2 Corinthians be? Well, if the first one was a group going to third heaven, second group went to paradise in the great multitude rapture, we know the third one is the Lord coming to them. And when we go to 2 Corinthians 13, look what it says. This is the third time I'm coming to you. <laughs> and this time, if I come, I will not spare. Well, we know that, right? He's going to destroy all who come against Jerusalem when he comes at the end. So if we go to what it's like at the end, what are we seeing? All the saints salute you. So all the ones from here that were there in the rapture, they're already now gone, and they're saluting the group as the Lord is saying, hey, next time I come, I'm now coming to you, and I won't spare when I come this third time. It's fantastic. So the, one of the key reasons I was showing you this was so that you could see that there are the first fruit workers, which are from the weed harvest, and then there are the second first fruits unto the Lord, which are the grape harvest. Okay, so we're seeing this conversation of them. We're now at the end of the seventh year of seals. There they are with the lamb. They're receiving this anointing. They've been sealed. They have all of this stuff. They've been given so many blessings. We saw in Matthew 16 everything that they were going to receive, right? Well, look what happens. 
I'm sorry, not in Matthew. In Mark 16, we saw they had powers to cast out devils, right? That if any serpent or anything they took up, nothing deadly would hurt them. Well, if we go back now to Luke chapter 10, and we know that this was them that came into the harvest to help bring in the great multitude rapture of the wheat harvest, and then they're going to go out during the time of the first half of trumpets. Remember, the Lord is now here. He came on heavenly Mount Zion. We now know that when he comes on Mount Zion, he's about to start, uh, the not he, but Zerubbabel, the other one with him, the city and the streets with the wall and the temple are about to start to get rebuilt. And what's happening during that first half of trumpets? During the first half of trumpets, which is about three and a half years, the 144,000 are going out into all nations evangelizing. Right? Just like Mark 16 said. They're going out into all nations evangelizing, and they're going to be able to what? Cast out demons and do all these things. So here is where they're going from city to city, and they're doing all these things. And then what do we get in Mark chapter 10, verse 17? It says, And the 70 returned again. This is, this is now about mid-trumpets. And it says, with joy, saying the Lord, even the saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto thy name. What were they doing? They were casting out devils. Just like we read in Mark chapter 16, this power that that group representing the 144,000 would do. They cast out devils in his name. Now listen to verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. When does Satan fall like lightning from heaven? Satan falls like lightning from heaven in Revelation chapter 12. Right here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, that dragon cast out that old serpent, the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world, was cast out into the earth. When is he cast out into the earth? At the first woe. What is the first woe? The first woe is the fifth trumpet, and I saw a star fall, uh, a star fall from heaven. It was given to the keys of the bottomless pit. And what does he do? He opens the bottomless pit. This is mid-trumpets at the fifth trumpet. Right here, they finished now. They were out there preaching and proclaiming, evangelizing for the first three and a half years of trumpets, casting out devils out of people. And then he sees Satan cast down like lightning, which is the fifth trumpet when the pit is going to be opened. This period of time is when Messiah gets cut off. And what happens at this point when Messiah is cut off? Well, look at what it says. Um, starting in, in Revelation 9, verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and, un uh, and unto them was given power like the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So clearly, when are the 144,000 working? Trumpets. This is, this is the middle of trumpets. The fifth trumpet is about three and a half years into the trumpet judgments, which is a total of about ten and a half years into the tribulation. Who are these guys? Clearly, they're the 144,000. So what, what happened? What brought them? How did we get to this point of them being the... The, this midpoint, okay? If we go back to the seven churches, if this is to the end of the portion of seals, here's trumpets now starting. They're going out doing their missionary times, right? And then what happens? At the end of about three and a half years of trumpets, which is 10 and a half years since the 14 years began, it's now going to be what? The time of Israel's removal. This is when the king, is Messiah, the high priest and king is cut off. When this happens, at about ten and a half years in the tribulation, 
the Laodicean age begins again. So what is this portion of time when the pit is opened, what else happens? Well, for that, we can go to Revelation chapter 17. And we see that the connection in verse 8 says the beast that thou saw was. What's this was portion? It's the about second half of seals. About two and a half years into the tribulation of seals, the Antichrist, as Revelation 13, gets his power to continue for 42 months until the Lord comes at the end of the sixth seal, destroys all the enemies, and then is not. Because the beast is not during the first half of trumpets. And then what happens? Shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And goes what? And goes into perdition. Where is the prophetic perdition of tribulation? It's when the pit is opened at the first woe when Satan is cast down. And what happens at that point? All those that are sealed with, with the, the Father's name in their foreheads, they have the power not to die and not to be hurt by these things. And they could take up serpents. So we saw for the first half of trumpets, or the very last year of seals, <clears throat> they help bring in the great multitude rapture. They're there on heavenly Mount Zion. They're, they're in the presence of the Lord. They have been given powers and abilities and strength. They can't be hurt. They're not going to be affected by these scorpions that come and sting the people. And this is at the time of mid-trumpet. So they've already gone out. They were doing their evangelizing portion during the time when, when the city and the streets and the temple were being rebuilt, which is the first half of trumpets. And the Lord had made a covenant with all nations. So even though the first four trumpets are falling around the earth and destroying a whole bunch, the Lord has a covenant still with all, with all nations. Until Satan is cast down, which is the fifth trumpet when the pit is opened. At this point is the point where in Luke chapter 10, he sees Satan cast down like lightning. And then what are they given? All of these additional powers that these things won't hurt them. We saw in Revelation 14, I mean, look at where they are. They're, they're, they were brought to Mount Zion, in Mount Zion, redeemed from the earth. They're the first fruits of the grapes to the Lamb. No guile found with them without fault before the throne of God. You see? And the Father's name written in their foreheads. They're the Father's being given to the Son. They are the first fruits of the grapes. They go out evangelizing as Philip, Philadelphia. During the first half of trumpets, they're able to cast out devils. They report back to Jesus. Why are they reporting back to Jesus as we read in Luke chapter 10? Because Jesus was there. He was their high priest and king. And Zerubbabel, who was there, is responsible over the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the wall. When the city streets and the temple, like the wall and the temple are rebuilt, we know it's about the midpoint of trumpets. Let me show you how we know this. Our famous place we've gone to many times over the years is Psalms 90 and 10. Psalms 90 and 10, the days of our years are three score and 10, which is 70. And if by reason of strength, they're four score years, which is 80. So from 70 to 80, yet is that strength labor, which is pain, toil, wickedness, sorrow, definition for sorrow, affliction. It means it's 10 years of tribulation if you can endure 10 years. And then it says, for it is soon cut off, which means there's 10 years in a period of soon, which I believe is about six months. So you're in the 11th year, about 10 and a half years in, and then there's the cutoff and we fly away. Well, what is that cutoff and we fly away? It's the exact same connected time to the fifth trumpet at the first woe when the pit is opened. You see, we saw right here, we see the first half of seals. We see the second half of seals and then the was caught up great multitude rapture. You have the 1260 days, which is the first half of trumpets while the city streets and the temple are being rebuilt and the 144,000 are going out and and evangelizing, casting out devils. When that 1260 days are done, the first half of trumpets, 
we see Satan is cast down. When Satan is cast down, we know it's the first woe. And when it's the first woe, what does it say? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. So we're at about mid-trumpets, about ten and a half years into all of tribulation. Satan is cast down, and he goes after the woman with the flood, who then flies away on the wings of an eagle into the wilderness, into a place where she is prepared and is nourished for a time, comma, and times, and a half. So it means one plus two plus a half. So the woman is going to be taken away into the wilderness out of the, out of the final three and a half years of tribulation, the last three and a half years of trumpets, the woman is going to be taken away till the very end of the 14th year. But we read that, and, and what is this period of time? It's exactly what we just read in, in, in um, Psalms 110, right? And then soon we fly away. It's directly related to Revelation 12, 14, when they fly away on the wings of an eagle till the end of the 14th year. But we know when it says Satan is cast down, when the pit is opened and the 144,000, the Lord is, re is letting them know after they go back to report to him, the Lord says, hey, I saw Satan be cast down and now they're giving these powers so it won't hurt them. We know it's connected to the fifth trumpet and we know at that point it says Satan is cast down and that he knows that his time is short. Well, is his time the all of the final three and a half years? No, of course, we've shown what it is. It's only two and a half of the final three and a half years. And we know this, of course, because of Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, right? How long will it be? And it's told for time, times, and a half. There's no end between time and time. So it's one, two, and a half for two and a half years. Until they have, shall have accomplished to scatter the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Why is it finished after two and a half years? when there's still one more year to go, well, that's because at the seventh trumpet, remember, when the seventh trumpet begins to sound, the mystery of God is finished. When the seventh angel begins to sound, which is the start of the seventh year of trumpet judgments, which is the beginning of the 14th year of tribulation, the mystery of God is finished. Why? Because that's the Lord returning as lightning feet down on the Mount of Olives, on the day and hour, no one knows from Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to show you what that connects to in a moment. So let me show you first what we know about those same 11 years. Okay, those first 10 and a half in the 11th year. This was a great one that we showed years ago when I first found it. And I talk about it every once in a while. It's 1 Kings 6, 37 and 38. What do we know is taking place? Well, we see that in the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Well, if we go to our chapters to years and we go to Zechariah, which represents the fourth year of seals. Let's go see what Zechariah. Chapter four says about the temple being built. Here's the two olive trees, the two olive branches, right? Who are they? They're Zerubbabel and Joshua. They're the two witnesses. One is responsible for the rebuilding, the overseeing and rebuilding of the city, the streets, the temple, right? The wall. And the Lord is the Joshua high priest and king. He is the Melchizedek, the Messiah ben Joseph. And what happens? It says, uh, where is it? Verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and uh, his hands shall also finish it you see zerubbabel lays the foundation and he's going to be responsible for building the temple well according to uh first kings just as we've revealed throughout scripture is only the foundation is going to be laid during the time of seals and it's going to be in the fourth year just as it revealed in zechariah in the chapters to years but what do we know is happening during seals 
only the foundation will be laid during the time of seals. Who represents the portion of the foundation? You would think, well, oh, the foundation must be the seals workers, right? That, that Smyrna group, the two in the road to Emmaus represented by them, because they're there during seals. But it's not. The foundations are connected to the apostles. And we know this because of Revelation chapter 21. When New Jerusalem comes down, we see that New Jerusalem has 12 foundations which represent the 12 apostles. Okay? So that means during seals, even though the, the other group of remnant worker disciples, the first watch group, are also working seals, their work is not about this foundation being laid. And it doesn't mean the apostles are the ones physically laying the foundation. All right? They're laying the spiritual foundation while a physical foundation is being laid. When trumpets begins, we know it's during the first half of trumpets that the city street and wall, as well as the temple, get rebuilt. So you need foundations laid, which is during seals, before you can build up the walls. And we've been showing that, hey, it's the 144,000 who are the walls. And that's exactly what Revelation 21 tells us about New Jerusalem. And he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, that is according to the measure of a man, okay? That is of an angel. So what do we see? The 144,000 represent the portion of the walls. And what do we have about the gates? The gates represent the 12 tribes. And the gates, as we've said many times, is that final group that we saw at the end of Matthew's gospel for which they're going to go out and teach the ways of the world and the Lord is with them till the end of the world and they're going to go out to teach the ways so that people can come and worship the Lord coming in through the gates to worship him accordingly as they were taught to, to do. Okay, coming at tabernacles every year. So we can see that Though the apostles are the foundations, they're laying spiritual while physical is being laid. We know that the 144 represent the walls, which is the first half of trumpets, while the temple is being rebuilt as well. And then we know the gates are the post-trib for those that go the, during the millennial reign. The ones that are from Luke in the first watch, as I had mentioned before, the Smyrna group, the Priscilla and Aquila types, they're the ones who have what? Put their necks on the line. They were the ones beheaded during the time of seals and they're going to be resurrected to reign with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead live not again till the, till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such, see, just as Smyrna says, on such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. You see, this is where you get that understanding. We know that each of those three watches are like the video showed in, in, the, in the, the website I showed that there are three priestly portions in the end of days. And this first portion of the priestly ones are Smyrna here. Philadelphia is the second one. And their main portion is during trumpets and they represent the walls as the 144,000. And then, of course, those who go out during the millennial reign, they're the third watch, and they're representing that final third priestly portion line. And so the focus here, as I said, we're touching on all of them, but the focus is the 144,000, the middle one. And now look what happens. When we go back into 1 Kings 6, you see the rest of the story to mid-trumpets, when it says, and in the 11th year, Bang. What did we say? Ten and a half years. In the eleventh year, which is about ten and a half years in, it says in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished. So it took seven years to build from the fourth year of the foundation that was laid, and then it took seven years, which brought us to in the eleventh year, about ten and a half years in, for the temple to have been built, which is with the city and the wall as well. How do we know it's with the city and the wall included with the temple? For that, all we need to do is to go to Daniel chapter 9. 
in Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, which means, just like we said, we know Jerusalem is the first place to get attacked when the 14 years begins. Haifa and Tel Aviv at the beginning of the 50, at the end of the 50 days, Syria is coming, they're going to destroy Jerusalem. And there's going to be a commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. But it's going to take what? Seven weeks of years. The only thing that's going to happen in those seven years is within the fourth year, the foundation having been laid by the modern day Zerubbabel and those who were brought back in with him to do it. You see, comma and. What most people believe is that the description that comes next with this three score and two and one, they believe it's all connected to this same week. It's not how it works. It's seven weeks of years, comma, and, which means separate and addition to. <clears throat> These are the seven years of seals. And then you have comma, and, the three score in two weeks, which is about three and a half years. Two weeks is two years. And three score, which is 60 in represented weeks, would be 60 weeks, which would be a year and two months, which gives you about, you know, three years and two months. All in all, that's why I always say about three and a half years of trumpets, which is a total of about ten and a half years, just like the cutoff that you saw in Psalms 90 and 10, just like the time it took to rebuild that you saw in 1 Kings 6, 37 and 38. And so what's going to happen during this first about three and a half years of trumpets? The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. Until what? Well, we know that the temple is also being built. Now we also know that the street and the wall is also being built. And after the about three and a half years of trumpets, Messiah. Remember, because he was here as high priest and king, he's cut off. And there's a war that goes against him. See, the, the enemy is going to, at the cutoff, which is ten and a half years, is now going to go after them with a the flood, just like Revelation 12, 13, 14. Right, Revelation 12, verse 13 and 14. And then unto the end of the war, like Revelation 11. The war is going to go from when Messiah is cut off. This war is going to last two and a half years against the two witnesses who are connected to are the modern day Zerubbabel and Joshua Yeshua, the high priest and king Melchizedek. That's the time of the cutoff. It's the exact same time. When he says, I saw Satan cast down, fall like lightning. It's when the 144,000 are given that additional power. And when it says, then Satan knows, is it filled with wrath? Because he knows that his time is short. That's because of what we saw in Daniel chapter 12. <clears throat> the time that he has that short is only two and a half years of the final three and a half years. Because in Daniel, once that two and a half year war is over, what happens? Messiah, the two witnesses are killed. And people think, oh no, that's so crazy to say Messiah is going to die again. Yes, and I'm going to, as we bring this to an end, you're going to see why he must die again. It's, it is because of a portion within the 144,000. But it's not all just because of that one person, priestly person, in the 144,000. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the law. And it covers all of them. So we see that when Messiah is cut off, ten and a half years, it lasts two and a half more years. During those two and a half years is when those guys had the power and the serpents couldn't hurt them and everything else for the 144,000. And this war that comes to an end is the two and a half years when Satan saw and knows that he has but a little time and it was filled with wrath. It's going to last two and a half years. Until what? Until Messiah returns to confirm the covenant that he made at the beginning of trumpets with all nations. At the end of the, at the, end of the seventh year of seals, starts trumpets, he made a covenant with all nations. He had to break it when he was cut off. Because Satan was cast down, the pit was open, and war broke out against him and the two, as the two witnesses. And so he had to break his covenant. 
when he comes back at the final 14th year, feet down on the Mount of Olives, he's going to confirm the covenant for that final week that he made. That's what's actually going on. And so when this, when this uh, uh, Messiah cutoff happens, we know that it's when he breaks his covenant. Well, if we go again to Zechariah, and we saw in chapter 4, that in chapter 4 was when the foundation was being laid. We come to chapter 8, which again is our chapters to years. Chapter 4 of Zechariah, the foundation was laid. Chapter 8 of Zechariah. What do we see in chapter 8 of Zechariah? The Lord is now there. He's on heavenly Mount Zion. It's the mountain of the Lord. Right? We saw the 144,000 were there in Revelation chapter 14 with the Lord. And what does he tell them? Let your hands be strong because they're going to start rebuilding, right? Um, uh, uh, you which heard the words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid that the temple might be built. Because now they're going to start rebuilding the city, the streets, and the temple, and the temple is going to be laid on the foundation that was laid during seals. So we know it starts and directly in our chapters to years at the start of trumpets. And then, how long is it going to take to build it? About three and a half years. Foundation was laid in chapter 4. And then you've got your total of what? Your seven years to build it. After the foundation, after the foundation was laid. So, that would mean if we come to chapter 11 of Zechariah in order prophetically in the end of days, in the chapters to years, we should see then the same thing where now the temple is complete, but now Messiah needs to break his covenant because Satan's been cast down. And we see in Zechariah uh, 11, the vintage of old which has come down is Satan that's been cast down. And what does the Lord need to do? Verse 10, I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people, and it was broken in that day. Every single place in the 11th year, right? 10 and soon. 7 and then about three and a half years. 11 years, in the 11th, in the 11th, in the 11th, in the 11th, over and over and over and over and over again. At this point, then it's Satan's war against the two witnesses that lasts for two and a half years. And we saw, as we said in Revelation chapter uh, chapter 9, that the 144,000 were now having been sealed by God, can't be hurt by these things. We know that they have powers over these things. And it would appear that somewhere in all of this, there's been a fall, a corruption by a portion, either a person or a group of people within the 144,000 priestly line of the second watch that were under Messiah, who was their high priest and king. And how do we know this? It again brings us to the chapters to years. If you go to the story in Luke or Mark, when it comes to the money that that um, Judas was given in chapter in in Luke and in Mark, you don't read anything except that money was given to Judas. There is no amount of money being declared. Only in Matthew's Gospel, chapter uh, chapter twenty six and twenty seven, do we know that he covenanted with them the exact amount, which was thirty pieces of silver. Okay. In chapter 26 and in chapter 27, it says it again. See, for 30 pieces of silver uh, that he was valued at for the children of Israel did value. And they gave him the money into the potter's field. Right? We all know that story. Only Matthew's gospel tells us that it was the 30 pieces of silver. And it says it more than once. But in the other gospels, it doesn't. This is prophetic insight as to why one says it and the other two do not. Why didn't one of the other two say it and not Matthew? There's always purpose when it comes to the word of God, obviously. And the reason it's in Matthew is because Matthew is prophetically the picture of what in the end of days? The time of trumpets. 
right? It's the time of trumpet judgments. They've been removed from the land during seals from the first attack. And I mean, from the attack on Jerusalem when the 14 years began, they're removed from the land. Only a portion with Zerubbabel are brought in to rebuild and only get the foundation laid until the Lord is coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. Seals the 144. The great multitude rapture happens. He makes a covenant with all nations. And now trumpet judgments begins. This is Matthew's portion in the scriptures. So it's no surprise that in Matthew's gospel only, we see the covenanted, covenanted amount that Judas got, which was 30 pieces of silver, right? Cast in the potters and so forth for the field. Well, do you think that it's a mystery as to why the time of the cutoff, which is Zechariah chapter 11, when the fifth when the first woe which is the fifth trumpet opens when satan's been cast down and the pit is open when the 144,000 can't be hurt by it that we see when messiah cuts and breaks his covenant that he had made with all nations why is he doing it because the one represented the the typology of the son of perdition who is the one who for the 30 pieces of silver huh that i was praised verse 13 and the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them into the potter in the house of the Lord. Just so happens, 30 pieces of silver is mentioned in chapter 11, 10 and a half year mark of tribulation, three and a half years after the city and streets and the temple were built. And the Judas character is the typology of the one who what who fell he fell and he fell and did it for 30 pieces of silver and here we are in chapter 11 of Zechariah directly connected to the portion of trumpets which is Matthew's time and it's directly connected to Judas when he gave when he received 30 pieces of silver you seeing what's going on if it's happening during trumpets and it's happening during this group it's connected to the 144,000, meaning something is going to happen to a person or a group of people amongst the 144,000 who will fall. Let me show you this example. When we saw at the end of Mark's discourse, we saw how that the conversation being had was a pleasant conversation, and it was to the Luke group who was working till the end of that sixth year of seals, right? before as he appears unto them in another form like mark 16 and then he goes to the 144 when he goes to the 144 of course we see that he railed on them because they weren't ready believing these workers that were there during seals and so they're going to know that it's connected to the day and hour but they won't know what exact day it's uh, what time it's going to be at but they're aware and that's why they were able to go and tell the end of mark 16 that next group of workers because they were aware but of course they denied, oh, whatever, not knowing the day and hour and so forth. But when you go to Matthew and you go to Matthew's discourse, who's the group that's working during Matthew's discourse, which is trumpets time? The 144,000. And he railed on the 144,000 from the beginning because they weren't, they weren't prepared. They, they didn't believe the testimony of the, the seals workers. And so now we know that they're working during the time of trumpets, which is grapes time. And they're the first fruits of the grape harvest. And what are they doing? They're working during trumpets. And when the son of man comes at the end of the 13th year of tribulation or at the start of the 14th year, that seventh trumpet, the seventh year of trumpets. What do we know? We know that he's coming on the clouds of heaven, right? Everybody will see him from one end unto the other as lightning. And he's coming, of course, on the day and hour that no one knows because the 14 years with the attack from Syria on Jerusalem's destruction will start on the day and hour no one knows. He'll come at the end of the sixth year on the day and hour no one knows to start the seventh. At the end of the 13 years is the day and hour no one knows because it's the end of exactly 13 years. It'll be on the day and hour no one knows which is the Feast of Trumpets, and listen to what he tells them. 
Watch this. This same conversation, listen to what it says. Matthew 24, 48. So here we are. We're now at the end of the 13th year of tribulation. The six years of trumpets. Remember what happened. They rebuilt the city and the streets and the temple. And what was being rebuilt? The city, the streets, the wall, and the temple. Zerubbabel oversees it. He is the one who will finish rebuilding as the one who laid the foundation. He's anointed as one of the two witnesses to finish the rebuilding of it. And Messiah ben Joseph, Yeshua, Melchizedek high priest, who is the high priest over the 144,000 who are his priestly line, that son's with them. We know they're there and they're now, while the, while the walls are being rebuilt in the city streets and temple, they're rebuilding the spiritual walls of the people like the apostles were the spiritual foundation while a physical foundation was being built. The 144,000 are the spiritual wall while the actual wall is being built. But we know that there ends up being a break in the wall. You get it? There ends up being a break in the wall as we read in Scripture. And it's connected to something that happens as a Judas type. This Judas type, this representation of somebody or a small group within the 144 that end up falling and succumbing to all of this power and all of this authority that they've been given. Haven't we seen that over the over the decades? Right? People rising up with so much power and authority in the church and some of them just can't take it and they come crashing down. Right? We have a good example of that here too, don't we? And so this is what happens. But imagine in the presence of the Lord and of the Father and receiving the Father's name. You belong to the Father and almost as if nothing you can do will hurt you. Could you imagine that kind of power? Well, that's the kind of power the 144,000 will have. And do you know what it means? It means that the 144,000 can't be lost forever. Do you know that? They cannot be lost forever. So here we are, having understood that that's what was represented during the first half of trumpets, the wall, the city, the streets, the temple being rebuilt, while the, while the 144 are the spiritual walls being rebuilt. And then at mid trumpets, about 10 and a half years in, Satan's cast down, the pit is open, the 144 won't be hurt by it, clearly telling us and showing to us that the 144 worked during trumpets. And what do we know? This war breaks out against the two witnesses. The 144,000 have this power. I'm not sure what they're doing, maybe fighting off different demons, doing different things. But it would appear that in that period of time of trumpets, there is a fall by one or by a small group. Remember, they were railed on, as I've said a number of times, <clears throat> at the end of Mark, for that watch group representing the 144, which is the second watch. They're the ones who work during trumpets, and the end of Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew's discourse in chapter 24, is that final returning of the Lord of the 13th year or the end of the 6th year of trumpets. And listen to the report that's given here. In verse 48, Matthew 24. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Which means there's going to be an evil servant, at least one, who's going to be like, oh, he's never coming back. He's never coming back. Because remember what happened. He's going to, the war breaks out against him, right? So you will have seen, you will have been in the presence of your Lord as the, as the 144,000, in the presence of the Lamb, in the presence of the Father, thinking everything is now set up, you've got all this power, Satan is then cast down, Messiah gets cut off. And you've got all of this power and all of this authority that was given to you. And then Messiah gets killed. What? You see? They're, they're going to be they're going to be upset. They're going to get prideful, whether it's one, you know, this says that evil servant singular, but whether it's one or represented as more than one, it's the same as the Judas type. Did Judas go and do this? Did Judas turn around and start smiting all the other fellow servants? 
the other apostles and disciples? No, of course not. Because this is a prophetic representation. It's prophetic to the end of days for which Judas was a typology in the is. And what does it do? Smite your fellow servants, begin to eat and be drunken. Verse 50, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Remember what it said? If we go back to Luke chapter 12 from the three watches, we know the first watch doesn't have anything negative. We know from Matthew and so others that the third watch doesn't have anything negative. So when he's telling them to watch and it's the first, second, third watch, he then goes on to give this warning in verse 45 of Luke 12. But and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. Hello. He's talking about the second watch and says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to beat the manservants and the maidens and to eat and drink and be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come at a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. It's, it's talking, why, why does Matthew chapter 24 at the end, which is the Lord returning to start the seventh year of trumpets, the end of tribulation, <clears throat> why is that conversation being had here because it's absolutely directly 100 percent connected to the portion of trumpets and the 144,000 working during the, the time of trumpets remember <clears throat> the reflection is matthew's portion the typology is judas it's the 30 pieces of silver which represents the 11th year about 10 and a half years into everything after the walls represented by the spiritual 144,000 of the spiritual walls while the physical walls had been rebuilt. And we saw that at the fifth trumpet, which is in the 11th year at about 10 and a half years, when, the, when, the, when Satan is cast down and the pit is open, that that's the point when Satan is here, Antichrist is brought back, false prophet is there, the pit is open, it's, it's the worst chaos on the earth, like Matthew's discourse says, than it ever was in human history, nor shall ever be worse than this after this because it's the two and a half years of the little time that satan has from revelation 12 that he has to now wreak all the havoc he can possibly wreak and what caused this well we can see it's the judas type it's it's one of the priestly lines in the hundred and forty four thousand during the portion of trumpets so remember, <clears throat> remember that. Remember that it's clearly connected to the portion of that group from trumpets. Okay? Now let's go into the Gospel of John and watch this. You see, what you're seeing today is not only the timeline, you're seeing also the understanding of the seven churches and when you understand Smyrna are the seals workers and Philadelphia are the trumpets workers, this is the first watch and the second watch, you can understand that you can't have this before you have this. And the confusion that happens with so many people always pointing to Philadelphia is because they don't understand prophecy correctly. It's not against them. They just haven't yet been given the revelation. So they always think we're in Laodicea and then they could just pick and choose whatever they want from here for the timing of the end of days. But we show, no, that starts the beginning of the 15. It goes all the way down to the end of the 14 years. And so what is the Laodicean time? Of course, it's after the about first three and a half years that Philadelphia had in trumpets, <coughs> excuse me, while the city and the streets and the temple and the wall were being rebuilt. This is the fifth trumpet. When Satan's cast down, the pit is opened and the 144,000 are given the power to uh, not be hurt by anything that should hurt them or, or want to hurt them that can't be hurt by any deadly thing. And from them, we know somebody falls who is a Judas type because Judas is also called the son of perdition. 
You see, does that mean <clears throat> in the end of days that Judas is the Antichrist? That he's the, he's the picture of the Antichrist? No. No. He's a picture of the one that falls during the time of trumpets. He's the picture of that the person or small group of people of the 144 of that priestly line under Christ that end up falling. And the representation of calling him the son of perdition is because it reveals to us the timing in which it would happen, which is at the fifth trumpet at about ten and a half years in the 11th year of all of tribulation. That's what it's revealing. And so we're getting more clarity. You can understand the periods of times within the churches. You can also come to understand much more clearly these, these points within the chapters to years that give us all of these clues in the prophetic end of days within their chapters. <clears throat> so now watch this. We're going to go. We showed how the Lord receiving them into paradise in chapter 14 was directly related to when he receives that great multitude into paradise in the seventh year of seals. Now, we're going to cover the trumpets of John chapter 15 through 19. You can even say 20, but John 15 through 19. Okay? Now, let me start by first going to what I was sharing with you guys in the beginning, in which many of you guys know from the differences in the discourses. As I mentioned earlier, if you're new, in Luke's discourse, uh, sorry, in Luke's gospel, when Christ is going to the cross, he's arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means radiant, beautiful, everything else. Okay? That gorgeous, beautiful, radiant is white like the bride. That's the pre-trib Gentile bride. And from it, a group is cho chosen to work during seals. And then the Mark portion... So the ones that are working during seals, they're not purple. They're, they're the white ones. They're the ones shedding the Lord's white, and they are part of the white, gorgeous robe of the, of the pre-trib group that was taken. And then at the end of Mark's gospel, we see when Jesus is going to the cross, he's arrayed in purple. And he's arrayed in purple as a representation of the Mark group, those who are the left-behind church, which represent purple, who endured seals, they're the purple. When you go to Matthew's gospel, we see that in Matthew, Jesus was arrayed in scarlet because scarlet is the tribulation portion of trumpets, which relates to the Jews. Well, why is this a big deal? For one, it clearly gives us that there's these differences in the gospels. And when you understand Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days as Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you understand that a gorgeous white, beautiful white robe is a bride and that purple and scarlet are both tribulation colors that the woman riding the beast wears. It's not hard to understand what's happening. But what do we know? What do we know from this group? Let me show you about this purple. We know that in Revelation chapter 7, as I had shown, we know that the 144,000 are sealed from among men on the earth before the great multitude rapture happens. When it came to the pre-trib, we know that there was a group of, of pre-trib workers who were informed before the pre-trib happened. They were the first fruits of the wheat harvest from the first fruits being taken to the third heaven. And this group is the first fruits of the grapes who are going to help bring in the great multitude of the wheat harvest. They are not wheat, they are grapes, but they are sealed from among men on the earth before they go to the throne, before they go to paradise where the lamb is. And so they're being sealed, even though they're the first fruits of grapes, they're being sealed to help bring in because the wheat workers need help because it's such a great number of people. Okay, so we know that they're happening at first. So what are they? They're they're part of the purple. They were the they were part of the people that were here during seals. So they're part of the purple, which is all of this group during the time of seals, and they were here during the time of seals. So what are they? They're part of the purple group. 
so when we see in mark's gospel that jesus was arrayed in purple and we know purple is part of the tribulation colors we know that this is the group that went during the time of seals <clears throat> i want you to remember that because this purple is 4209 and what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the gospel of john so luke was gorgeous white mark is purple for the people during seals and then for the people during trumpets, Lord is represented in Matthew's gospel as scarlet. Okay. Now we're going to go to John 15. John 15, as you can see, is the time of the beginning of trumpets. So if it's the time of grapes and the 144,000 were the first fruits of the grapes chosen from among the people before the great multitude rapture, then they're also purple, right? Because they're from the purple group but they were chosen from the purple group as the first fruits of the grapes who are going to now be with the Lord and are going to work during trumpets. So let's see what Revelation 15 says. <clears throat> All of this is related to the 144,000. John 15, 1. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Listen to this. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Remember what I said? There's always like this warning. There's always this be careful to these guys. He unbraids on them. He's warning them. It's, it's as if he's aware, obviously, that these guys need to be reminded regularly to do as I'm about to tell you. And if you do, everything will be okay. But why is he always doing it to this group? which is the second watch, 144,000. You see? Because of their stiffness, their stubbornness. So it says, Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine so again what's happening he's now telling them hey don't try and go out on your own on this because nobody can bear fruit unless it's connected to me another kind of little warning to this group no more can you ex uh no more can you except you abide in me i am the vine you are the branches he that abideth in me and i in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. Listen to this. If you, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. Remember what happens? They get cast, they get cast out, right? Weeping, and gnashing of teeth. He is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Okay, we don't really see much of that, right? So a lot of people like to say, oh, well, that's, you see, we can just ask the Lord what we will. A lot of prosperities will say that. We just need to ask the Lord, and he'll do what, what we ask him for. No, this is clearly speaking to a very specific group of people and does not apply to everybody. Okay. Oh, it would be great, and there's sure there's applications of it in a spiritual sense in our daily walk. But looking at it for what it says, it is clearly speaking to a group of people from the is and prophetically speaking to a remnant group of workers in the is to come. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Listen to verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then Christ says, you are my friends. So if he's speaking to the grape ones, being the vine and the branches, and they're to bring forth fruit because they're part of the first fruits of the grape harvest, then the Lord is saying, look, no greater love as anybody than to lay down his life for his friends and you are my friends jesus is saying 
I will willingly lay down my life for you guys. In the prophetic, we know because that's exactly what he's got to do, but there's a reason for it. And yes, it's because of the Judas type, which represents this priestly person or group during the time of trumpets in the 144. Yes, it relates to them, but is it only for them because of what that one person or that small group did? It's not only for them, and I'm going to show you as, as we go a little bit further in. But listen to what is said here. This is pretty profound and, and kind of makes you just say, whoa. Because in verse 14 of John 15, it says, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. <laughs> Yikes, right? Only the Lord can get away with that one, right? Could you imagine telling that to your friends? Hey, if you're going to listen to what I'm trying to get you to do here, then you can be my friend. <laughs> imagine opening a conversation like that. Uh, yeah, see you later, dude, right? But these guys are aware it's the Lord. You see, the 144 know it's the Lord. Everybody who is a remnant worker, they will all know that this is the Lord, the creator of all, okay? So, but he tells them, look, you're my friends. I'm willing to die for you if you do whatever whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You see everything this group gets? This is all about the 144. Everything that the Son was made known by the Father, this, per this group gets. They have the Father's seal. Why would they have the Father's seal and not the Son's seal? Well, because they belong to the Father, and the Father gave them to the Son. And whatsoever the Father is the Father's is the Son's, and whatsoever is the Son's is the Father's. Hello. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it you. Verse 20. Remember the word uh, that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. <clears throat> kind of another warning, right? If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have, uh, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. Okay, watch this. Now we're going into the second year of trumpets. Okay, chapter 16, wait till you see what, what it's said about here. Okay, he's starting to tell them, he's starting to prepare them that he's about to leave. Okay, that he's going he's gonna to have to depart from them. Verse 7, nevertheless, uh, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, expedient for you that I go away. For I, if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, uh, I will send him unto you. Watch this. Verse 16. And you find out that he's saying it over and over and over again. A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me. Because I go to the Father. He goes on. It's like they're saying amongst themselves. Where is he saying? He's going for a little while. He'll be gone. He's going to come back after a little while. And then he, they, they repeat it. And here's the third time. In verse 19, and it says, Now Jesus knew that they were uh, desirous to ask him, and he said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves of what I said, A little while, and you shall not see me, and again a little while, and you shall see me? Are you ready for this? Listen to what he says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice but the world shall rejoice let me ask you something when christ in his death and resurrection did christ at, at his death at his sacrifice did the whole world rejoice no the whole world had no idea we what 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 did this mean then we know that it meant within that region, within that area, the people rejoiced. So really what's being said is 
it really wasn't the whole world rejoiced. You know, it was the people of that area. So it's like a little, you know, typology, if you will, a little, you know, the whole world is going to rejoice at it. But the whole world didn't rejoice. It was just a group of people who were in the area at that time and that heard and knew about it. But what does it say? Remember, we know these things are prophetic. So he is forewarning them that soon the time in the midst of trumpets, he is having these conversations along the way as they go wherever so the, wheresoever the lamb goes. They're, they're, they're preaching, right? They're, they're evangelists going out during the first half of trumpets. They're casting out devils. And the Lord is giving them insight and helping them out with things along the way and preparing their understanding. And he says, you'll lament and weep, but the world shall rejoice. If this isn't prophetic, and if it isn't speaking about a period of the end, why does it say the same words? Watch this. Revelation, uh, let's start Revelation chapter 11, verse 9. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Remember, the two witnesses die. All you got to do is go read Zechariah and realize that Zerubbabel, who lays the foundation and will rebuild the temple, which is the first half, half of trumpets, when the city streets, temple and wall are being rebuilt, Zerubbabel is one of the two witnesses, whoever the modern day Zerubbabel is going to be. And it says that Joshua, who is a picture of Yeshua, the high priest and king, the rule is going to be between them both. They are the two witnesses. And so it means when the war breaks out against the two witnesses, and we know it's going to last two and a half years during Satan's wrath time of the short time that he has, when that war is over, like Daniel 9 says, and when the end of the war has come, that's when the two witnesses are killed. And the two witnesses are dead for three and a half days. This is why we say the differences within the Gospels are so prophetic. Because when you go to the discourse, uh, when you go to the Gospel of Luke, we read in chapter 11 that it says Jesus would be as Jonah was, a 40-day warning, right? Well, Jesus never was as Jonah was warning the people. He didn't do that at his resurrection. It's prophecy. It is yet to be fulfilled prophecy, and that's when he comes during the 40 days after the pre-trib wedding. And then in Mark, he says, no sign shall be given to you, and he got in the ship and he left. So that's a clear contradiction. If one said 40 days like Jonah, and then the other one says no sign and he left, why do we know there's no sign for Mark, just as we did as Mark 9.1? They will have seen the Son of Man come with his kingdom, with, with the kingdom of God because they're seeing heavenly Mount Zion, but they don't know when they get to go. They don't know when the great multitude rapture is going to happen. It doesn't happen as soon as they see him coming. It's not till about halfway through the seventh year of seals. So it's the same thing. They, no sign they're going to get. It's going to be bang, and then their time comes. They're not aware of when their time is. And then when you go to Matthew's gospel, in the sign of Jonah, Jesus says, that he will be as Jonah was three days and three nights. Do you understand that Jews will tell us, and, and many pastors will tell you, oh, that the Jews tell us any part of one day and part of another, it still counts as a whole day. No, that's a bunch of BS. Because look, their dead bodies were three days and a half in the street. Why would you say and a half? There'd be no need to say a half. You already understand, oh, that's already a full day. It doesn't matter. No, that's not how it works. In the story of Matthew with Jonah, it is three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Which means Jesus hasn't fulfilled that yet. The three days and three nights in the heart of the earth has not been fulfilled. That's why everybody's so confused because they read from Matthew's gospel in relation to the death and resurrection where 14, 15 other verses in, in scripture say that he resurrected on the third day. If he resurrected on the third day from when he was taken into the hands of sinful men, crucified, and then put in the grave, that would have been like four and a half days 
Impossible. It never happened yet. It was prophecy. Jesus will fulfill those three days and three nights. So if he is in the grave for three days and three nights, when would he resurrect? On the fourth day. Three days and three nights in the grave. At his death and resurrection when he was here 2,000 years ago, his death and resurrection, his, he was only in the grave for about a day and a half. It wasn't three full days and three full nights. The only place in Scripture where we see a three full days and three full nights, which means the resurrection must be, if it's three days and three nights, it means the resurrection has to be on the fourth day. The only place we see that happen is with the two witnesses. And when you go to Isaiah and read those early chapters, you know, three, four, five, six of Isaiah, you will clearly see that the two witnesses are going to be whoever the modern day Zerubbabel is and Yeshua Messiah when he comes as high priest and king, Messiah ben Joseph. This is why the Jews say they believe that Messiah ben Joseph is going to die in war. They're 100 percent true. Because Messiah ben Joseph, Jesus Messiah, the high priest and King Melchizedek, is going to die in war in the second half of trumpets when Satan and those guys go after the two witnesses and the war lasts for two and a half years. You see, that's what it said. When they have finished their 1260 days, what ends up happening? They goes after, goes after them and shall make war. Who goes after them to make war? The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. Okay, so when does the beast come out of the bottom of the pit? The fifth trumpet. And the war is going to last the two and a half years, which means to the end of the war when they get killed is two and a half years later, which is the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of 13 years. And what do we see? Here's where <clears throat> they were killed, right? We see where, where is it? We see where they were killed, three and a half days. And then we see, it's the end, right? It even says in the same hour, right? They resurrected and boom, in the same hour. So this is right at the end of the 13th year of tribulation, right at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, the end time of that, of that sixth woe. Exactly as scripture has shown, which is the time at the end of Satan's two and a half years in the second half of trumpets of the three and a half that remained. But what did it say in John chapter 16 for the reason I brought you to this? <clears throat> what did it say? Jesus said that the whole earth shall rejoice. Well, look what happens. <clears throat> Here's the two witnesses, Zerubbabel and Yeshua Messiah dying. And what happens? Revelation 11 verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts. Did you see that? Let's go back to John <clears throat> chapter 16. And let's read that again. Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament but the world shall rejoice the earth shall rejoice the only place in all of history future and pro uh, <clears throat> past and future where the whole earth the actual literal whole earth will rejoice is when the two witnesses are killed he was prophetically telling you he is one of the two witnesses, and it's at his death that the whole world will rejoice. See that? Amazing, amazing stuff, guys. John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. You see, it's all over the place. All of this power that they have. I came forth from the father and i am come into the world again i leave the world and go to the father verse 32 behold the hour cometh 
Yea, is now come <clears throat> that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Look at this. Now he's warning them that the time is going to come, which is what? When he's taken into the hands of sinful men, right? So this prophetic picture of when, when Satan is cast down, right? That's what all of this is. He's, they've got these powers. They're sealed by the Father with the Father's name. They have all these powers casting out devils that they were doing in this first half of trumpets. And in this conversation, he's warning them that the time is coming. He's going to be cut off and be gone. But don't worry. You're going to see me soon again after that. Soon I'm going to be gone, but then soon I'm going to return. And he says, and what's going to happen at this point is I'm going to be scattered. You guys are going to be scattered when this happens. Well, what is this scattering that happens? Watch this. Remember Daniel chapter 12? The 144,000 are scattered when? When everybody gets scattered, just like Revelation 12, uh, uh, Daniel 12, 7, which is the in the 11th year at the mid trumpets time when when the uh, um, when the Judas has now deceived the Lord and it's made known. Right. The prophetic typology of the son of perdition. When does it happen? It happens according to scripture in the 11th year after the rebuilding is done when they fly away. It's all connected to this period of time, which we see should connect us to John 18, which we saw was connected in Zechariah chapter 11, which we saw in Psalms 90 and 10, which we saw in 1 Kings 6, 37 and 38. He's warning them of that time. And when is it? It's when Satan's time, time and a half is given when he has from Revelation 12, that short time. It's two and a half years. And what is it? Ha what happens? And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So he's, the power to scatter them is going to be two and a half years. So when does this scattering power begin? It begins in the equivalent of chapter 18, which would take you what? Halfway, partway, right? Through 18, 19, and then 20 would be that two and a half year point where the resurrection would come. Okay, so we now see also, <clears throat> excuse me, in chapter seven, uh, in chapter end of 16, he's telling them about the scattering. Well, that's because that's, again, another warning of what's going to come when the when the when Satan is cast down. Now, let's see. Let's go to verse uh, chapter 17. So chapter 17, of course, is like the 10th year of tribulation which is the third year of trumpets, the city, the streets, the wall is still being all built. Starting in verse four, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou hast given me. Unto the men which thou hast given me out of the world. Thine they were. And thou gavest them me. And they have I kept. Uh, sorry. And they have kept thy word. You see what's happened? We know that the 144,000 are the fathers because they're sealed with the father's name on them. And the father has given them to the son during this portion as this priestly line. Remember, in, in the third heaven, in heaven, the, it's the priestly line that's before the throne, serving the Lord. That's them. And then it says, uh, verse 7, now they have known, listen to this, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Verse 9, I pray for them, I pray not for the world but for them which thou hast given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. But now I am not come into, uh, sorry, but now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. 
Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. You see all this real strong conversation of the son to the father praying over this group that the father gave him praying over them you know what you know what it really strikes me as with the 144,000 i believe that they are probably going to be younger people and when i say that i mean like maybe late teens early 20s it seems to make sense as to why they're there's like they're stubborn right we could see they always need this strengthening, even with all this power and authority that's being given. They're, they need the extra prayers over them. But, of course, we know they're going to need it because Satan's going to be cast down and it's going to be a crazy time. We saw that in Luke chapter 10, when this mid-trumpets time that's coming up, as when Satan is cast down, we see he gives them all this power over the enemy and everything else. And he says, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are made subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And he says, I thank you, Father, <clears throat> right, Lord of heaven, that you have revealed these things unto babes. Okay, he's revealed them to unto young children. And it doesn't mean little baby kids. I believe what we're seeing <clears throat> is that the, the 144,000 are much more likely to be a younger group of people. You may have heard that said before. I've heard it said, you know, that the Jews have a Cohen line of people in different parts of the world in mysterious secluded locations around the world, and they've had them for centuries. And they're being taught none of the things of this world, but only Torah and how to be obedient and follow Torah. And they're, they represent, they've said that they're their 144,000. And when they reach the age of 20, then they can no longer be there. They move on and they go into different fields of work. But there's always a group of 144,000 in parts of the world, Jewish people that are being prepared at all times. They're taken from birth from the Cohen line and raised in those places. So it's pretty wild to see. And you've probably heard other pastors say that, you know, when this all happens, it'll be a group. I could see the young people, right, the, whatever, the new generation, that they would be the ones. And I, I've been having this sense of that lately, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're not little kids, but they're late teens, 19, maybe to 20 years old. It would appear relates to the 144,000. And it may be one of the reasons, too, that it says that they're virgins. So they will literally be virgins. And in literally being virgins is because they would still be younger as well. Okay, so that's that would seem to line up with all of this warn, warning and all of this, you know, stubbornness that they have like teenagers have. <clears throat> right. So even though in the presence of the Lord, there's these things that are happening, but they belong to the father. And we could see in all this, they've been given to the son. <clears throat> And he's praying over them and praying over them and praying over them. And here we are <clears throat> in John chapter 17, which is the 10th year. So the city, streets, temple, and wall that Zerubbabel's building is about to be coming to an end. And look at what we see in verse 12 of John 17. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou hast given me I have kept, and none is lost. I like that, right? None is lost, but. <laughs> How often do we see that, right? I didn't lose any of them, Father, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. You see, Judas is the son of perdition. Has it been made yet known to Judas? No, <laughs> but Jesus knows it's already in his heart. He's already been been taken by Satan and it's already in his heart. But the but nobody knows this yet. So this Judas son of perdition typology, this representation of the one that falls within the priestly line of the hundred and forty four thousand. The Lord is now aware in the midst of trumpets 
that this is going to happen. And of course, we know that he's aware of it, right? But now this is where we see him take, where it starts to take place. <clears throat> so let's keep reading. Verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Okay? And we know who the evil one is. Verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, and they also might that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So we're seeing they're being sanctified and all these blessings from the Lord, yet he knows in the midst of them there are those or the one, the evil one that's fallen away. Verse 22. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them that they may be one as we are one. Verse 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, over and over and over again, you see, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, and uh, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Verse 26, the last one, in seventeen, chapter 17, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. All of this is this conversation to the 144. All of this additional strength and prayer and prayer over the 144. Do you know why it's also so strongly prevalent over them? Because it's the midpoint coming up. It's the midpoint of trumpets. It's that, you see, we're in chapter 17. <clears throat> By the time we get to chapter 18, it should be the prophetic picture of the time of the abomination of desolation. The city, streets, wall, and the temple have been rebuilt. And it's time that Satan is now cast down. The pit is opened. The son of perdition is now being exposed. He's going to go stand in the holy place because the temple has now been rebuilt. This is the second half of trumpets. This is the ten and a half years in the eleventh year. And what is the eleventh year? Well, to the chapter of John, it would be chapter 18. Which would mean this should be the point. <clears throat> as Zechariah 11, when Judas, who as Matthew 26, 27, and Zechariah 11, in representing the money that Judas was, we should have a prophetic picture in the understanding of chapters to years that this is now where Judas has made the betrayal. He knew it, Jesus knew it, and still continued to pray it over all of them even though he knew that Judas had already been fallen and been corrupted in his spirit. But where does he get betrayed? It should be chapter 18, <clears throat> which is this period of time here. Mid-trumpets, at the fleeing into the mountains again because now Messiah is being cut off and the two and a half years of Satan's wrath with the Antichrist declaring himself God as the son of perdition happens in the 11th year after everything is rebuilt. So let's go to uh, John chapter 18, which comes next. And look at what we see. 18 verse 1 when Jesus had spoken these words you see he had been speaking praying all these things over them when Jesus had spoken these words he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron where was a garden you see again you the garden portion you're only finding in John here at this point which is perfect because it's the garden which you see heavenly Mount Zion paradise came down <coughs> and it says which were in a garden, which was in a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. Verse 2, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes restored thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers. Verse 5, They answered him, Jesus, Naz Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said unto them, I am he, and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. When did Judas 
reveal his betrayal chapter 18 chapter 18 when is the cutoff of the betrayal zechariah chapter 11 70 to 80 years then soon which is in the 11th year 10 and a half years the city the streets and the temple the temple foundation being laid seven more years in building in the 11th year and in the chapter of years the betrayal by the one who is the judas type son of perdition who is one of the hundred and forty four thousand <coughs> represented as either an individual or a portion of the hundred and forty four thousand who fall to satan at this time is represented by those who were already being disciplined from the very beginning when christ came who by the end of trumpets when the lord returns at the end of the 20th year and he's returning feet down on the mount of olives that he comes to them and sees that there was an evil servant who wasn't prepared and wasn't ready which is the same group as the second watch that was warned about in luke chapter 12. it is the priestly line of the second watch group <clears throat> was the ark it is the priestly watch line of the second group the second watch that caused and did this fall and look at how it's john chapter 18. john chapter 18 <clears throat> is a represented picture of in the 11th year and in the physical what happened to christ we know that when he was taken into the hands of sinful men <coughs> excuse me he was taken into the hands of sinful men he was beaten imprisoned right kicked and so forth then crucified put in the grave and resurrected on the third day from when he was taken into the hands of sinful men the entire story was what about two and a half days from when he was taken into the hands of sinful men what's the prophetic picture in the end of days two and a half years remember there's a picture of days as years years as days always plays out like this prophetically in the prophetic of scripture so when we see this we know that it took place as about two and a half days in what took place in christ's death and resurrection the first time and in the is to come how long does satan have to reign in his wrath when he goes after them with a war when the cutoff happens about two and a half years time times and a half so you've got the prophetic imagery of two and a half days to two and a half years and when that war of the two and a half years of the two witnesses from the cutoff takes place then messiah the two witnesses are killed when the war is over and then what after three days and three nights which is on the fourth day yeshua jesus will fulfill the jonah prophecy of matthew's gospel of resurrecting after three days and after three nights which is one of the two witnesses and when we go to john chapter 20 which is a prophetic picture of the very end of the 13th year right to like this line between 13 and 14 or 2021 if we go to john chapter 20 well let's go to 19 first if we go to 19 look at what we see from that purple i was talking about earlier we see that jesus here is arrayed in a purple robe this robe is 4210 4210 the one from Mark's group was 4209. And here we are still in trumpets time. Not at the return of the Lord yet, but we're in the trumpets time to where he's been cut off. And when he's cut off this war that's breaking out against him, who were the ones with him? The purple. They were the priestly line with the high priest Melchizedek. And in this purple, because they were chosen from among the purple group, being the first fruits of the grapes, chosen from among the purple group, but they're not the same purple group. They were chosen from among them. Well, look at what happens. This purple, which is like what? 
chapter 19, the, the 12th year when this war is breaking out against Messiah, because of who? Because Satan is cast down because, but, but what happened? What's, what's the picture? He was deceived. You see, he was deceived by Judas. It was all part of the plan. He's deceived by Judas. And in this deception by Judas, it's part of the purple. And this purple, look where it comes from. This purple, 4210, comes from the purple of 4209. Just like the 144,000 came from the group of men that were sealed first from the purple group. They were a representation of a portion of that purple group. It's craziness. Now look what happens when you come to 20. Now Messiah has been killed. There's your about two and a half years as your prophetic two and a half days. And now what happens in John chapter 20? In John chapter 20, we have the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you know what's interesting about that? In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the resurrection of Jesus is in the last chapter of each of them. Only in John is the resurrection of Jesus in the second last chapter. Why would the resurrection of Jesus be connected in the last chapter as the prophetic end of the 13th year of tribulation or as the end of the sixth trumpet? You want to know why? Watch this. In Revelation chapter 11, look what happens. In Revelation chapter 11, when the two witnesses are killed and the whole world, the whole earth will rejoice over them, it's three and a half days, which is on the fourth day, which is after three days and after three nights. What ends up happening? Then they stand up on their feet, right? The Spirit of God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. So at the end, right before the very end of the sixth year of trumpets, right before the very end of it, they stand on their feet again. It's the resurrection of Christ. And boom, they're taken up, right? Well, check what happens. Look at why John is in chapter 20 with the resurrection of Christ. It's not in the last chapter like every other one because John lays out a prophetic picture of the timeline within chapters to years. And you want to see the proof of it? Look at what it says in verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. You go read it in Mark, you go read it in Luke, and it says rise from the dead. You go read it in parts of Matthew, and you read it here, it says rise, now, not just rise again, and then the rest of the story. It says rise again from the dead. To rise again from the dead means that he's going to rise again. Literally do it again. So why was Christ willing to die for this group? Why did Christ do this? Well, as I showed you, they were sealed by with the name of God in their forehead. They belong to the Father. There is no way to save this group of people again if they fall after everything they've witnessed and been a part of, that if they fell, the only way to save them would be if Christ died again. And that's why Hebrews chapter 6 literally tells us, verse, starting verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. All of this is about the 144. They were in his presence. They were sealed by the Father. All of these things. They were given all this power and all of this authority that nothing should hurt them. Casting out devils, doing all of these things. That if they should fall away. Listen to this. Verse 6. If they should fall away. So now, is it really just one like that evil servant? Or is it maybe a, a small group or a group of them? We don't know for sure. I believe the evil servant, the, 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 um, the Judas type, is a, is a picture as one person reflecting maybe a small group of the 144 that this happens to. But what does it say? If they shall fall away. Well, when is the falling away? We know exactly when the falling away is. It's the time of the apostasy when Satan's cast down, the pit is open at mid-trumpet's time. 
It's directly connected to the same time. It says to renew them again unto repentance because they were partakers of all of this glory with the Lord, all of this power, all of this authority, that if they should fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God again. They re-crucify him and put him to an open shame. That's terrible, isn't it? But we know that scripturally, it is part of the Lord's plan. Do you know why it's part of the Lord's plan? We can clearly see unequivocally that it is directly related to a group within the 144,000. Those are the ones that have condemnations the whole way through. We know it's directly related to the Judas type and the money. And we know that Judas type is the portion to Matthew. We saw that in Revelation chapter 9, the 144,000, the ones that were sealed, were the ones that couldn't be hurt by, the, by the, the, the stings and so forth. We know they're all the same ones that were part of this, that, that had part in all of this glory that belonged to the Father. And so if they belonged to the Father and they were given to the Son, and whatever's the Son is the Father's and the Father's the Son's, and not one could be lost, yet it says except the, the one, the son of perdition, who's represented as the Judas, as some of those 144 that fell, if none of them can, can be lost, but they've tasted of all these great things already in the Lord, they cannot be left forever. Which means what? Which means the Lord will die again to save them. Because they cannot be left. Remember Luke 10? But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Their names are written in heaven. They were partakers of heavenly gifts and of the Holy Ghost. Their names are written in heaven. So the only way to save them after having fallen away again is by the Lord dying. But remember, who are they? They are a priestly line. They are the second watch priestly line of the 144,000. But is the Lord only doing this for them? Or is it going all the way back to the beginning of the law and the Lord is going to save all of them from the priestly line? If we go to Numbers chapter 20, you guys will remember this. We've talked about it in the past. The Lord told Moses and his brother Aaron that they are to speak to the rock before the eyes of the people. And look at what happened. In Numbers 20 verse 10, Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, which is a representation of Jesus, <clears throat> and he said unto them, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Uh-oh. You see, the, you see the, the, the pridefulness like it's their doing? When the Lord told them that he would do it, that it's the Lord doing it, all they had to do was speak to the rock, and they start to get a little cocky and say, must we do this? Do you see what happened? Is It says, and Moses lifted up his hand with the rod and smote the rock twice. Jesus, the rock, is struck twice. Moses is responsible for that first strike. And Moses was responsible for the people of Israel. When Jesus came and died on the cross, he took the strike that Moses caused. That was the first strike. Jesus died for the sins of the world. And in part, that was connected to Moses' strike. Jesus, when he does it again, he is not going to do it for the sins of the world. He's going to do it to save the priestly line. Aaron was the high priest. Jesus comes at the end of seals into trumpets as the high priest Melchizedek, the Messiah ben, Jude, ben Joseph of the firstborn of Ephraim, who is the high priest and king Melchizedek, who is the greater, as Hebrews 11, 7 says, who is the greater than Aaron. Aaron is responsible for the second strike. The second strike has not been paid for to save the priestly line. What is the sacrifice for the priestly line? 
for that we finish up right here in Leviticus chapter 1 it always started with the atoning sacrifice of the bull for the priestly line of Aaron and his sons which is represented as Christ the high priest and the 144 priestly line of the second watch during trumpets when Jesus comes at the end of seals to begin trumpets as Messiah ben Joseph as the firstborn through the son of Ephraim their symbol is the ox he is coming as the sacrificial ox when Christ came the first time he was what he was a male sheep a lamb without blemish which is already fulfilled and in the final at Jesus's birth he was the two turtle doves for the sacrifice at his birth so just like Matthew Mark Luke in the end we saw Christ's birth represented by the two turtle doves for the sacrifice we saw the mark group when he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and he was the sacrificial sheep which was for Moses's strike to save the the world but there is a group outside of the world which has always been his priestly line and that priestly line who is part from the father given to the son cannot be left in outer darkness forever but there must be a sacrifice of a bull the ox of atonement for the priestly line and we all know this hasn't happened yet but what does the world and what do the Jews think this represents they think that they're going to have to sacrifice a red heifer nope it is going to be as their prophecy of what they know is when the Messiah Ben Joseph is killed in the battle at the end of the two and a half years as one of the two witnesses that is the prophetic sacrifice of the bull who is the atoning sacrifice for the priestly line who is Messiah Ben Joseph Yeshua Jesus that is what's happening this hasn't happened yet so when we bring this to an end and we come to Matthew chapter 24 what do we see happens that evil servant <clears throat> we see that the evil servant is going to be cut asunder and his his portion is going to be appointed with the hypocrites where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth do I believe that this servant is going to be cast into hell and the pit for the burning flame forever and ever no no I don't because there was the sacrifice right of the bull he the Lord became the sacrifice of having to do it again as Hebrews said and they cannot be left because they belong to the father they were sealed their names are already written in heaven so the Lord had to be this atoning sacrifice for the priestly line all the way back to Aaron which was the first high priest and king and for the Aaron line of his sons all the way back for the things that they had done wrong and they're gonna have to be saved so what's gonna happen to this Judas type to this to this fallen wicked servant and this group represented by him as the one as a portion of the 144 they're gonna be cast into the weeping and gnashing of teeth area well if we go to Revelation <clears throat> chapter 20 we see that Satan is bound for a thousand years so the Antichrist and the false prophet the beast and the false prophet are cast into the pit at the end of at the end of uh, trumpets Satan is then bound for a thousand years during the Satan bound for a thousand years the first seals workers that had nothing spoken negatively against them they're going to be resurrected to rule and reign with Christ as priests and they're going to reign with them for a thousand years that's the first priestly line watch and then when the thousand years are over and Satan is loosed there's going to be another period of another quick battle where the Father God is then going to come down and poof devour him with a flame and Satan's going to be in the place where the beast and the false prophet are 
in the lake of fire. So where where is that 144 group that fell that were saved by the bull sacrifice, which was the which was the Lord? Well, we see then the great white throne judgment happens. So there's the thousand years. Then there's the battle after the thousand years are done. Then there's the great, the great white throne judgment. And then when you go to Revelation 21, now you see something. Now you see a group of people you haven't seen since the end of the 13th year of trumpets. You now see New Jerusalem coming down after the millennial reign and after the battle of Satan, after the millennial reign, and after the great white throne judgment, what do you see? You now see the 12 tribes, which are the gates that were there during the millennial reign with the others that were there as priests and, and ruling and reigning with the Lord while these guys were going out and teaching the ways of the Lord for the millennial reign. The apostles were already in heaven, of course, and look at who we see now. The walls that are represented by the wall represented by the 144,000 are now coming down. I find that interesting. That, to me, tells me that the portion of the weeping and the gnashing of teeth that that group is going to have to endure for their fall and what they did against Christ, they will be saved. Because that's what the sacrifice of the two witnesses, in particular of the ox, who is the high priest, Yeshua Messiah, that's what it was for. It was the prophetic revealing of the final sacrifice, not for the world, but for the priestly line of those who were anointed and belonged to the Father that had been given to the Son. They cannot be left, and they will not be left. They will have to endure for a time. Obviously, looks like a thousand years. But at the great white throne judgment, before the millennial reign starts, it would appear that's where the forgiveness comes for all those in the priestly lines from Adam that have fallen. You see, because they haven't had an atoning sacrifice yet. Yeshua Messiah had to be that atoning sacrifice. And the priestly line of it was the one of the second watch from the 144,000. Clearly, it cannot be of those during the millennial reign because it happens during trumpets. And clearly, they're connected to the time of the wall, which is being rebuilt during trumpets. It cannot be the first watch because they were the heart, the, the first part of the first fruits of the remnant workers of the wheat harvest who are going to bring in the great multitude rapture of the wheat harvest for which the great first fruits are being sealed to help us bring it in. But then the grapes are the ones working trumpets represented by the wall. It's all about this fall of a of a group within the 144, but the Lord has purposed it, obviously, because it's given to us in Scripture. And it's purposed to reveal to us that going all the way back to, to uh, Moses and Aaron with the law, that there was still another sacrifice needed for the second strike to cover the priestly line since the law began and Aaron was its high priest. Brothers and sisters, it's pretty wild, wild stuff to understand. Isn't it crazy? It just, I mean, you go through this stuff, man. It just, my head spins. Like, and it, I've just redone this video. <clears throat> I just spent three hours yesterday doing it. So, man, it's, you know, this stuff, when, when you absorb it, when you take the time to study these things out, not just listen to it and so be it and whatever, but really diligently seek as the Lord tells us to do like Enoch and you seek and diligently search these things out. It is just incredibly, incredibly awe inspiring to understand even something as as terrible thinking that the Lord is going to die again. But it is purposed. It is for a reason. 
and now we can see and understand what it is and what that purpose representation is during the second watch of the 144 that will bring it back all the way back to the time of Aaron's line. Man. So brothers and sisters, let me finish with this one thing that many of you, you know, when it comes to a, to a, 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 a priestly line, a remnant worker group, many people want to be part of a remnant worker group. And I agree. I think it's an honorable thing to love the Lord so much that you're willing to to want to work and, and do whatever it takes to serve the Lord during the time of seals or trumpets. You know, maybe some are the 144. I highly doubt it that you would know what you know now, and yet you'll be one of the 144. However, it is highly probable that many of us would be and are being prepared as a portion from the Luke workers. And what I want to say is that as honorable as that is to desire this to serve the Lord, it is first and foremost far more valuable to watch ye therefore, as Luke 21, 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Because everybody that is a part of this group is going pre-trib. And it is from this group that is going as Enoch did, that we're diligently seeking, watching and praying always to be accounted worthy. Everybody from this group accounted worthy to go pre-trib, it is from this group that the servants are selected from by the Father to serve the Son. So don't worry about whether you are or whether you aren't. Focus on the Lord. Diligently seek. Draw closer into his revelation. As you, as you come to understand these things more and more and more, you will start to see and understand that you're probably being prepared. You don't give the playbook to your team and then on game day say, all right, you guys go home. I'm going to give it to all the rookies that have never seen the book before. You following? So the greater you understand, the more diligent you are in it, the more prepared you'll be when the time comes, especially if your desire is going to be to serve him, that it's put in your heart. But don't forget, our first prayer is to be accounted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Because from them is chosen the remnant that will remain to serve him. Brothers and sisters, I love you always. I pray for yours, you and yours, every single night. I am so grateful for each and every one of you. I'm grateful that the Lord, for whatever reason, made it so that I had to do it again. And I'm grateful for the uh, new channel, Bride of Christ, uh, that have started up and that are that are strengthening each other, that are a part of Ministry Revealed as well. And uh, I was I was so blessed to be able to be a part of it and share just a whole bunch of things there. And we'll continue to, to join them and share things. And some of them have joined into the forum now as well. And anybody that's new and you hear me talk about the forum, just go to ministryrevealed.com. Click on the link that says forum. It'll take you a few seconds to sign up. And you can join us, about 1,200 people from around the world. With that, I love you all. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.